Hey Seekers, what's up? Welcome back. How are you? I have something really interesting for you today. It's going to need a little context. So let me explain. We just finished doing a series on Spinoza and Spinoza's relationship to mysticism. And on the very last video that we made, uh, which was titled, Was Spinoza Mystic? We had a very sweet comment from a certain Dr. John Verveke, who said very briefly that he thought that the class was brilliant. Thank you. And I was so excited to see that he was commenting that he liked what we were doing. So I said, hey, could we have you on for an interview? And within 24 hours, he had responded and we had made a time and we were sitting down and talking over Zoom. It was really awesome, really incredible. And we had a really great conversation. I had prepared like five pages of notes before the conversation, which I planned on asking him about. But the conversation really just went from zero to 100. And I thought of maybe to edit the video to like start with the more formal parts, but I thought in the end that you may enjoy the raw experience of the conversation as it was organic off the bat with Dr. Verveke. And as you'll hear in the interview, Dr. Verveke asked that I come onto his channel. So there's going to be a part two following up over on his channel. Links will all be in the description. And just in case you don't know who Dr. John Verveke is, if you're living on a rock in this internet age, allow me to read for you his brief biography. Dr. John Verveke is an award-winning lecturer at the University of Toronto in the Departments of Psychology, Cognitive Science, and Buddhist Psychology. His work, in his own words, is about using the latest findings from cognitive science and psychology to integrate science and spirituality to alleviate the ongoing meaning crisis. But the reason why so many people know Dr. Verveke's work is because not being merely satisfied with advancing the internal academic discussion and discourse around these questions of mindfulness, meditation, cognitive science, which are all very important work on their own, John, in what can really only be described as a heroic undertaking, went ahead and took all of his learning and all of his material, and he brought it to the public in a 50-part series entitled, appropriately, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. The series ran for about a year. They're an hour class each. I highly recommend going and checking out that series in its totality. And together with that series and his other educational content, John has garnered close to 2 million views and quite a substantial following to hear what he's bringing. I'm not going to tell you too much about it. You'll see it in the conversation for yourself. I thought Dr. Viveki would be a very good fit and a very interesting one for the Seeker's audience because his work is really about taking the cutting edge of cognitive science, psychology, and applying it to history, to mysticism, to the altered states of consciousness, to the transformative mystical experiences, which we are so deeply interested in exploring here on the channel in a rigorous, critical, and thoughtful philosophical way. And all with the hopes of alleviating from the meaning crisis, which John characterizes as a crisis which makes us feel disconnected both from ourselves, from each other, from the world around us, and from a viable future. It sounds very upper alley, doesn't it? What we're doing here is that we're trying to dig into the wisdom of the mystical traditions to see what they have to teach us for the current world and situations that we live in. It's been a hard time for many of us around the world, and specifically in the midst of so much violence and havoc, but I think that this work of slowly and carefully thinking about the issues that separate us, the issues that keep us divided, and seeing how we can mend them with the best tools of philosophy, science, religion, spirituality, mysticism. I think it's a worthwhile endeavor, and it's one which we're going to try continue to do. And hopefully, it will bring some meaning, peace, and wisdom to this shattered and battered world that we live in. Much love. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hey, John, how are you? Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late. I'm just coming from another, I was recording a Voices with Raveki. So I'm sorry, I'm two minutes late. But... No problem, no problem at all. What were you recording? Uh, so I was recording a conversation with Brett Anderson. Um, and he's a graduate student in psychology. And mm -hmm. I'm doing work with him and Mark Miller integrating uh, my work on relevance realization with uh, Carl Friston and Andy Clark's model of uh, predictive processing. That sounds all very uh, uh, <laughs> scientific and everything, but this surprisingly connects uh, with powerful ideas uh, from within mythology. So bridging between my work and Jordan Peterson's work and ideas about there being a deep continuity between the way cognition unfolds and the way reality unfolds. That's very consonant with some, you know, pretty, uh, pretty primor, uh, pretty perennial uh, sort of neoplatonic ideas about, you know, the deep participatory relationship uh, between 
uh, uh, you know, the intelligibility within the mind and the intelligibility within the world. Uh, so it was just an amazing conversation going the gamut from sort of hard nuts and bolts, you know, cognitive science and neuroscience to myth and, uh, you know, uh, and, and Neoplatonism. So uh, it was just, it was just, wow, it was just like, exciting. Uh, and he's, he, he reached out to me um, and he said, I think I can connect your work and, uh, and make all these connections. He's brilliant. Uh, and, you know, and we were just sparking off of each other. So it was just so much fun. It's just so much fun. I'm going to probably release that today or tomorrow. So, wow. I'm, I'm so, so and I'm so eager to talk to you. I was just so impressed. Oh, my gosh. I was so impressed by your video on Spinoza. I've only read, I've only got to see the one. I'm going to look at the ones that preceded it. Uh, but that was the one that caught my attention initially. And then I started just looking around. Just so impressed. Uh, just congratulations on that video. It was just, it was brilliant. Thank you so much. I, I Okay, firstly, the conversation that you just had is one which I'm so eager to listen to because everything, yeah. that, everything that you're talking about there is so up my alley. Like, like I yeah. can't even begin to explain. Um, although more from the philosoph philosophical than the scientific, perhaps. But um, I'm curious. I'm curious to know what what it, what was it in that lecture or in that class that I gave that that caught your attention? Because I I thought it might flop. I like I was going against the scholarship. I I really didn't. I didn't know what I was doing. Well, I mean, I'm a, I, I'm I, I'm I'm all for going against the scholarship as long as you go for, uh, go against it with careful argumentation, both exegetical and constructive argumentation. And you demonstrated both. You you laid out sort of these. I believe it was five arguments, five points. Uh, for why it's plausible, and you made a plausibility argument, which I think is, I think philosophy is the art of of plausibility, and you made a plausibility argument, like here's all these converging points that uh, that basically propose uh, that we should read Spinoza, especially the last the last section of the Ethics, and yeah. also uh, the earlier work, right? Uh, 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 we should read it through a mystical lens where mysticism is properly construed not as woo woo sure. but as a claim about a particular ontological relationship between cognition and reality yeah. and i thought that was just and i thought you know and i think that's core i think right from the beginning at, you know at the beginning of the ethics spinoza is, is figuring out this deep continuity between cognition and reality and the fact that it it it, it, it germinates and it comes to fruition in you know this state of sort of optimal uh, participation that strikes me as completely consonant and consistent. I've always found people's like, what the heck is going on in the last book of Spinoza? I always found that odd. I yes. was like, why are you finding this so inconsistent? Yes. It seems to me that like you're not like you you want to read Spinoza as, sort of as somebody pretty much like Descartes, and and I think that's a mistake. I mean, yep. the influence of Descartes on Spinoza is profound, but there are other influences on Spinoza that are equally profound, and you have to take their, them into account. I'm speaking too much. I'm sorry, but that, that's that, that. That was why I found, and I because that's always been my reading. I've always understood, right, and because I had the experience, and I, I relate this. I talk to people. I've had. I, I mean, I don't want to sound pretentious, but I got I got this, uh, and I've had it before. I've always been interested in this phenomena. This, this, this thing that happens, like when you're reading a, a great philosopher and you go from like thinking about them, even being convinced of their beliefs, it is more adverbial. You start to see the world the way they saw it. It becomes a perspectival participatory thing. Mm. And I, I, you know, I, I studied Spinoza religiously. I, I read each day. I would read a proposition and a proof, and then I would meditate on it, reflect on it. And I, and I, and I did it multiple times, and then reading the secondary literature. And I had this experience where... Right. And I, to me, it's very similar to like the Prajna experience within Buddhist meditative practices, where I saw the whole of the argument in each premise and the premise at, right within each whole with, within the whole. And I yeah. got and that and, and, and that moment was more disclosing of Spinoza's ontology than the content of all of his propositions. And I went that scientia intuitiva. Yes, And that is exactly what he's talking about. And you don't really get the ethics unless you have that experience. Yes. And I think that's what he actually claims. And yes. I thought you nailed that on the head. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I think, he, um, I think he, he sets up, there's some readings where, which read the ethics as a, a what's it called? A, a, um, a grin more like a spell, which actually induce that conscious experience in the individual. Well, you know what it reminds me of, and I wanted to ask you this because I've always had a, a, I've had suspicions about this. Uh, and I, you said, you know, he's probably he's obviously reading Maimonides, 
right? Yes. And and there's also I haven't saw the video yet, but it sounds like there might be some uh, some also some connections to Kabbalah. Yes. Right. Uh, right. And so I've of, I've often seen the Neoplatonism, right? Yes. Because the other text, and I'm reading it right now. I'm reading the Elements of Theology by Proclus that does exactly the same thing: the geometric method, and and it's simultaneously a, a propositional argument and what Pierre Hadot would call a spiritual exercise. Yes. You're being informed yes. propositionally, but you're being transformed perspectively yes. in an integrated manner. And I was wondering, I mean. Is, is that just a coincidence or was there any, is there any evidence of any direct historical influence? Because the two texts are so similar in format, like, you know, the, the geometrical method applied to theology and to a grand metaphysics. Uh, is there any indication that that might have been available to him, Spinoza? Because it just seems, uh, if not, it's just really weird convergence. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at the historical or, or textual case for a neoplatonic influence um but i'm sure there's one to be to be found and one to and i'm sure it's been been done already i did spend some time looking at because i presented an earlier class like a year ago on his influence from from the jewish mystical tradition of kabbalah um, which in and of itself is is highly highly neoplatonic drawing yeah, that I knew, yeah. drawing yeah. mainly from jewish neoplatonists like ibn gabriel um and there's there's been extensive work that's been done for I mean the the, the hints that the, the the suspicion even in the scholarly literature that Spinoza was influenced by by Kabbalists goes all the way back to like Wachter back to like 150 years already. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, recently yeah. there's there's been a whole um um what's his name a very there's a very prominent Spinoza scholar his name is Beltrand who did a 300 page work on really fleshing out the case Yitzhak Melamed has done a similar work on it Moshe Dell has has done similar work right. Um, right. and not that it's not that it's absolutely conclusive, but it's very very plausible. Um, yeah. All the way from from direct metaphysical correlates to textual and linguistic similarities to actual having the books in his library, you know, from from Kabbalists of of you know of the period, um, and and the strongest case is actually in one individual who's this fascinating character in and of himself, who's who's very much ignored. His name is his name is um, Abraham Cohen de Herrera, who himself was a Kabbalist and Neoplatonist. And he makes that explicit, oh. and he explicates Luriana Kabbalah Neoplat Neoplatonically. And he gets kidnapped by pirates. Like, it's a crazy story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in he's in Morocco, gets kidnapped. The, the queen has to intercede to get him released. He gets released to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam, and he ends up teaching um, Sol Matera and, and Menasha uh, Ben Yisrael, who go on to be the teachers and the community leaders of Spinoza. So, so there's there's that direct oh, line wow, there, yeah. Wow, and wow, and yeah. he's and he's he's not only is he a Neoplatonist and a Kabbalist, he's also like a self-identifying perennialist, which is I'm actually really fascinated by the Jewish perennialists, which which haven't been studied almost at all. So, can I ask you about that? Because I, uh, like I've I've come across a distinction, with, you know, and I sort of label it this two this two way between two kinds of perennialism. There's the Ald, the, there's sort of the Aldous Huxley perennialism. And, you know, and that's been subject to some pretty significant critique, you know, cats and others. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, but then there's Verse Lewis um, in the in his book, uh, uh, that perennial philosophy, which is different from Huxley's, makes yeah. a different case. He argues that there is a perennial philosophy, not convergent uh, across sort of cultures, but he said that there's a sort of a shared underlying, let's call it uh, a spiritual, cognitive, cultural grammar running through, uh, all right, uh, the West, whatever that's supposed to refer to, right? And he says it's basically Neoplatonism. He basically says that, right. that, 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 right. that that's what it is. Um, and I thought that was really... Un so which one of the perennialisms are you interested in, or are you, or are you interested in both? Well, I, I'm interested in the phenomena as a whole, and I, I think there's actually more than two perennialisms. I think there's at least okay. six identified perennialisms um, going all the way back to the Hellenic period, to the Renaissance, with Mrs. Plethon and Marcel Ficono and Piccadon and Angela. Um, and then right. there's, and then I think by the time you get to Huxley and then the traditionalists who are another form of, like there's already, there's already been Sony before. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm myself, um, obviously the, the sort of the Renaissance form of Neoplate, of perennialism, that there's an actual lineage of great teachers going all the way back to like yeah. Zarathustra yeah. and Market. Like that's obviously, I think is, is a bit hard to, <laughs> to believe in historically anymore. But um, I think, like you're saying, that there's some sort of grammar of the human psyche, the organism, which, yeah, yeah. which, and I don't think it's restricted to the West. I think I think the East it very much comes into that. Where where I like to bring in some of the some of Huxley's 
uh, perennialism. There's now a movement even called neo-perennialism, which is basically Huxley post cats um, right. with work that was done by Houston Smith and others. And, and I actually do want to bring this up in the conversation with you where, okay, right. yeah, where, um, where there's an argument to be made to bring, to, to re-examine the metaphysical and epistemological propositions which we might be able to deduce from the varieties of mystical experiences that share some sort of underlying commonality. That's, it's kind of a... Okay, so yeah, yeah I think that's fair. And, and so I, you've probably picked up, I don't know how much of my work you're familiar with, but um, there, there's videos and also work where, you know, I'm very e deeply influenced uh, also by the Kyoto School. And I'm interested for, in for the fact that, for example, that D.T. Suzuki saw constant consonance between aspects of Zen and Neoplatonism, especially yes. uh, Christian Neoplatonism. Like he's constantly comparing Zen to the yes. work of Eckhart, for example. Yes. Um, so I, and I, and I, and I think there's something very powerful and interesting there. So I, I'm open to this. I mean, I'm more than open. I'm receptive to this idea Good. you're proposing. Uh, I guess I'm concerned. I mean, I, I mean, the version I saw within cognitive science, that's where I live, uh, right, was, was Foreman's version. Um, and I don't know if you're very familiar with that. Sure, of course, yeah. Yeah, and the pure consciousness event. And the problem, the thing about the pure consciousness event, I mean, it was very important for me. And Foreman pointed it out at the Tuscan thing. He says it's very important because it tells us something fundamental about consciousness. Yes. And this is where I got the notion, uh, the work I've done on, in Untangling the World Knot with Greg Enriquez about adverbial qualia as opposed to adjectival qualia. The, the, let's not get into the technicalities. The point is that uh, you know consciousness is, is is seems to be more primordially about here nowness and togetherness than it is for the kinds of adjectival qualia that go into our conceptual understanding of reality. And I think this is a way of understanding the pure consciousness event. And that's Foreman's argument, basically. Yes. He, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. he, he says, because it's preconceptual, it can't be subject to all the stuff yes. that Katz talks about. Yes. Yes. Now, and I, and I, and I'm, I'm, I find that argument convincing. I've experienced the, the event uh, in my own practice. And I, there's enough documented people talking about this from all over the place that to, to say the phenomena doesn't exist. There's more evidence for that than there is for blind sight, for example, which yeah. everybody talks about in yeah. consciousness. Now, so, all, so I think all of that is plausibly granted. The thing I then have is, but, you know, Foreman's argument seems to be a bit of a Pyrrhic victory in one sense, because he's basically saying, well, you have these deep commonalities, but they, they, are, they are not going to be translatable into um, your ontological statements. Um, that's what he seems to say. So, yes. like, uh, right. So is there a, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to get into a debate with you. I want, I want this to be dialogos very much. Right. Yeah. But I, 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 like what, like what, what comes out for you uh, on that when, yeah. like, firstly, did, did I present things fairly to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 you did, and I want to respond to those. I just want to, I just want to make a preliminary comment or two. One is, I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm a Hasidic Jew, as, as it may be apparent. Um, and in the Jewish tradition, going all the way to, to the, to the Mishnah, there's an idea of machlok at the shem which is, which is disputation for the sake of heaven, which means that, yeah. which means that in a space of, of love. Um, there's there's allowed to be heated um, headbutting and that's and that's how we create sparks for God. So so it's all within it's all within dialogue. Um, and and I sometimes oscillate between between being kind to my guests because I think like that's part of the job and also like wanting to to disagree. So it's all I think it's all fair game and and uh, and it's all really on a, on a basis of love and appreciation. Um, the other thing is that what you said about Suzuki resonates with me so deeply because I grew up studying Hasidic mysticism in first-hand Yiddish texts that had never been translated outward, besides for maybe a couple stories done by Buber and who knows what. And and then I picked up Christian mysticism just by mistake. And and as a 16-year-old, I started reading, I was reading these Christian mystics. I'm like, who who told the Christian mystics what I'm studying in my Hasidic class? And this was before right. I even had an understanding of Neoplatonism or, or the history of Kabbalah right, at all. Right, right. Um, so that so that is really what, what 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 caught me off balance for the very for the very and I've been in love since with it since then. In terms of Foreman, though, and, and since then I've gotten sort of deep into the history and the academic side of things, but yeah. um, for for the good and the bad. In terms of Foreman, I to be to be very honest, um, and I say this with with respect to him, I find his argument wholly underwhelming, um, not not unconvincing, but but underwhelming, um, and and a, and an injustice. To the to the historical, literary, and poetic data of mysticism, because it's so it's so it's so under in in what I think is an attempt to retreat 
from Katz's very fierce attacks, it so undersells what mysticism is. Um, and I think there have been responses post Katz to Katz um, by people like Rudolf Studstill and many others that that so much that 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 <laughs> that don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, which which I think is what Forman does. I'm interested in that. Yeah. So, Go, go ahead, go ahead. From I think I think from a cognitive scientific standpoint and trying to understand the the cognition and, and the and the mode of consciousness, that's all good and fine. And, and I think to, to develop a basis and a, and a baseline perhaps for what, for what functions mystically, which is what you do in your lectures, which I which I so enjoyed. Um, but this <laughs> to to talk the, the lines and I've I mean I, I haven't I have I've never gone out on the attack and I haven't published anything about this, but but I collected quotations. Please, please. Yeah, I collected quotations from Foreman where he speaks about how boring and how empty and how banal and how and how almost meaningless and insignificant. He writes that that had he not have realized, he would have realized it never happened. And then you turn to the mystics, and and that may be some very, very scratching the bottom. The mystics are having mind-blowing experiences that are changing their lives, yeah, that are transformative, yeah. that are that are rapturous, that 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 are unmissable. And and you read you read his PCE. And it's like, you're, okay, if you're even talking about the same thing, it's so far, far down the bottom of the line of continuum that, that you're, okay. yeah. Okay, I think that's a point of commonality then. So let, I, that's good. Because I read his book, you know, Enlightenment Ain't What It's Cracked Up To Be. And I think his confusion of the PCE, the consciousness event with enlightenment is a profound mistake. Yes, I, yes. I, 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 right, so I think, so when I'm talking about the PCE, I'm not talking about enlightenment because I think uh, his reduction there, I think, because it does, I mean, and I tried to cover this a bit in the series, and I've done this in, in some talks I've given. It, it doesn't account for the, the 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 transformative experience, the higher states of consciousness. Right. I, I don't think it even accounts for it at the cognitive level, which I've done a lot of work to try yes. and do. Yes. I, I've tried to I tried to build on it. So so let me let me try and throw out I don't know what it is an olive branch, right? A, <laughs> a, a, a potential bridging between us, because I do think, I do think that concentrating on just consciousness. Um, for, I, I want to speak, I, I want to speak carefully here. So let, allow me to be a, a little bit staccato, please. Um, nice. it, trying to ground it all in consciousness, right? What's happening in, uh, let's call it the transformative experiences that perhaps we can agree are at the core of, of, myst, of, of mystical ontologies, right? In terms of just consciousness, I think is inadequate. And I try to do more. I try to branch it out and say, okay, but what's happening in the consciousness is actually reflective of more, more profound processes of relevance realization. And then, and, and especially if you get to see this video I just did with Brett, and but also some of the discussions I've had with Jonathan Pajot, I think there's, and this is making use of an idea from Evan Thompson, uh, one of the great cognitive scientists of our age, right? Um, if there's deep continuity between the machinery of relevance realization and the way reality unfolds. Mm. Um, and I think the phenomena of intelligibility is exactly the participatory conformity between relevance realization and how reality is unfolding. And I take it, and this is why I'm so interested in Neoplatonism, because I take, I take Vers Lewis's argument seriously that when you are trying to get at like the intel, like Neoplatonism is an ontology that starts from the premise of intelligibility. That's what I take to be one of its, that, I mean, if you read the basic, I mean, go back to Plato, Plato's whole thing is how is knowing possible? How is intelligibility possible? And he's not, and the thing people do wrong is they hear that epistemologically. And mm. that's not what Plato is asking. He's mm. asking an ontological question, mm. how, and that's the question of how is intelligibility? And that he proposed, and I see Neoplatonism as a way of trying to take that and taught that ontology, uh, and go and and uh, what am I trying to say with and and realize it as a spiritual practice of transformation, not just a conceptual thing, which I think is also pregnant and within Plato. He wanted that to be happening. So I I think that I try to make an argument that there are universals not only to states of consciousness but to relevance realization that disclose some primordial participatory relationship to reality that, um, that are being disclosed in mysticism. And I was trying to convey that, and I was, that's why I was trying to emphasize the universality of these processes. Yeah. The, the trouble I have with, right, so this is, this is the part of me that's still influenced by cats, right? 
it, because when I've studied these particular, uh, like I read, I've read manuscript and transcript after transcript of people reporting on these experiences, and they go into these experiences and they come out of them with this same sense of deep connection and transformation, et cetera. But they often propose alternative or even contradictory metaphysics. Yes. Uh, and, and so I'm very hesitant, therefore, as a scientist, to attribute any, if, if there's variation in, in, in the independent variable that doesn't track the dependent variable, then that's not your correct independent variable, right? The considerable variation in what people propose metaphysically and uh, which is in contrast to the almost, I, yeah, almost perennial universality of the phenomenology and the functionality of, that they're attributing to the experience. So that's where I'm. I'm trying to. I'm trying to split the difference between those two opposing tensions. So what? How? What, I'd like. I'd be interested in what's your response to that. What you see? What I'm trying to wrestle with, and what yeah. do you think about that? I firstly, firstly, I'm, I'm deeply sympathetic to to that wrestling because that's I think a space where I find myself as well. Um, yeah. I I want to. I actually just want to read you a quote which I think you'll appreciate if you haven't seen it already from Charles Davis um, in his review of. Uh, mysticism and philosophical analysis by Katz. Um, and then I, I want to, I want to respond to what you said. Um, and, right. and, and maybe, maybe with a, with a, with a touch of a critique of, of something which I'm hearing now in, in your presentation and something which I'm hearing in general from, from your lecture series, which, which, Please. which just, which, which off the bat, um, I, I enjoyed so deeply. Um, and, and I know, I know a little bit like the work that it takes to put out content and the amount of work that it must have taken to put that out is absolutely heroic and is, and is a service, is a service to, to mankind. So thank you on behalf of mankind. Um, the, the quote reads like this, neither the mystic nor the philosopher can remain content with an irreducible heterogeneity of mystical experience. The mystic because of the, because the ultimate character of the experience implies universal claim. The philosopher because a diversity of universal claims is a challenge not a resting place. Thus, it is not an uneducated essentialist desire, but a religious integrity or philosophical urgency that mm -hmm. leads those who no longer find an exclusive claim by any single tradition convincing to seek an underlying unity and to investigate the equivalence of symbols under their diversity. I, that's beautiful. I, yeah. I do I do appreciate it. And I agree with the sentiment uh, being expressed there, the philosophical sentiment being expressed there. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, before before I respond to your point, I'm curious, I'm, I'm, you must, but um, the work of Jorge Ferreira, you, the, the participatory... Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, the participatory turn, I read yes. the whole book. Yes. Yeah, so so Ferreira is someone who's, who's I'm hearing a lot of echoes from your thinking, and it's, it's also interesting in, in, in when you present your case, you're presenting the scientific side of it, but in my mind, I'm hearing the phenomenologist, I'm hearing Kant, I'm hearing, the, like, I'm hearing the, the philosophical yeah. side, because in, and in your work, both of those are really resonant with one another. Yeah, yes, very much. And I'm trying to do that. Uh, yeah, Ferrer, I've, we, there was a meeting set up between Ferrer and I to, to, to come on to Voice of Verveke and then COVID struck and then schedules got out of sync. I'm going to reach out again. And, well, and I, hope, have him I, I sure hope it happens. So I, I think, I think, I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to hear Please you. Please give out. a critique. I want to yes. hear it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I want to give a preliminary critique, but I want to hear you out better to, to be more specific so, so that can be helpful. I think that I'm trying to develop my own um, sort of epistemology and metaphysic of mysticism very carefully and very slowly yes. in a way that's yeah. in a way that's deeply religiously and meaningful for me I'm also coming out of a fundamentalist background like you have so there's some commonality yeah. there but um but but in a way that's that's really painstaking and really and really slow and careful yeah I that careful thought is always appreciated I think thank you I think that the that the the, the metaphysic and epistemology um, and ethic that I'm that I'm working towards, but here more so the epistemology metaphysic is one yeah. is one which is predicated on on I think what is the fundamental assumption of mysticism, which expressed uh, is expressed differently is either unity a form of monism a form of non dualism which don't all mean the same thing. There's different terms meaning different yeah, things, yeah, but yeah, yeah. but but there's some there's some there's some shared characteristic there of a unity, a blurring of boundaries, a non-otherness, a non-separateness. And I think therefore that that the that the the epistemology and, and the and the metaphysic of mysticism themselves have to be have to be not two separate categories, but have to be be coterminous, which is why I love Spinoza so much because of his 
of his yep. dual aspect. And and I think that for, I think that for the mystic themselves, in I'm trying to really understand the mystic's own native epistemology and, and metaphysic in some sense. Mm-hmm. And and I think and I think I think for I think their native epistemology is one which does not differentiate between the mind slash cognition and reality. They they don't they don't have an in there out there epistemology metaphysic that we have because of because of everything because of as you know I don't need to explain to you um, and yeah. and I and I think that I think therefore the the talk the, the language that you that that you employ which is which is very much mind and and thinking focused and and tr- and seeing the deep consonants and mirroring and and realization that's happening with reality out there I think I think the I think I think the mystic may want to push further and more radical than that to yeah, say that that is yeah. only that is only alluding to what the real reality, which is that they that they are not separate, but our consciousness is reality and and, and vice versa. And yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot there. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that's good. Um, so two points. Uh, first of all, of consonants, and then response. Uh, the first point of consonants is uh, is when I pr- tried to talk about the four kinds of knowing. That's my attempt to actually reintegrate epistemology and ontology back together again, mm-hmm. because it's not just the question of what are we knowing. It's also who are we fundamentally. Uh, yes. And in that sense, it's a it's it, you know it's a kind of a post Heideggerian ontological claim about human being, uh, yes. and it's not uh, and also the corresponding l- levels of being within reality. So it's an ontological move as well, and and it's explicitly designed to do both of those at the same time. Uh, I, I probably influenced, I think, by uh, Spinoza, uh, well, because you know his his idea his idea about ideas is exactly that, right? It's both the form and uh, yeah. it's both the forming this way and the forming that way. Well, you know all that. I don't have to go into that. Uh, and so I think that that's one point of consonant. Also, I think, right, and, and I've said this in a couple places, um, uh, you know, is that I think unless I'll, I'll stake. I'll, I'll, I mean, I, there's maybe a burden of proof issue, but I'll put it aside for now, right? I think if you reject sort of an absolute skepticism, you're committed to some idea of, participa- of participation that both the external world and the external world participate in patterns that they that neither one of them has the ultimate authority over. Uh, you know, that, so the the participation isn't just this way, right? It's this way, and I've been trying to get at that with when I'm trying to talk about that. Uh, symbols are not just metaphors, right? But the, because a metaphor just bridges between the, let's say, between the subjective and the objective. But I think the true understand, I, I, the, it will be expressed metaphorically. I'm not denying that. But I think the true function of a symbol, and this is what I get from Tillich, right? Paul Tillich, right? I don't know if you're yeah, familiar yeah. with Tillich's work. Yeah, right? Right. It, is, is the idea that you look, it's, ther- it's like a stereoscopic vision. You look through the, 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 uh, the subjective participation and the objective presentation, and you see the common source that they both come from, and that's the that, that's the symbolic mode. And I do think that that is very much the case. I don't like even calling it symbolic because people just hear ornamentation and metaphor. But I'm trying to get something beyond that. Maybe Barfield was doing that. I'm not clear. Uh, I've got to. I keep. I, I'm ambivalent towards Barfield on this issue. Uh, because, but you know, because he invoked the notion of participation, that's why I keep going back yeah. to it. Yes. But so I, I do think what I just said is the case that um, I would put it like this: that the deep continuity that I am talking about in cognitive science, like there's a deep continuity between the principles of life and cognition, and between cognition and how reality realizes itself. Um, I, I'm reminded here of Nishitani's definition of religion as the real self-realization of reality, and, and I take that very seriously. That deep continuity ultimately grounds out in the fact that our objective and our, our subjective language, the deep continuity points to something that is deeper than the deep continuity, that there's an underlying onto- ontological yes. uh, primordiality. Yes. Uh, but I, I, but I, I think we can only... I, I, I'm going to use... The, go ahead, go ahead. I'm, say, I'm talking too much. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I, I hear the issue here, which is that we're trying to grasp at that which is precisely inexpressible and ineffable. That's right, right, right. And, and but but yeah. you don't want to fall into... And I get your point. I'm sympathetic to it. You don't want that ineffability just to become, the, if you'll allow me, the banal ineffability of Foreman. 
right? right? Yes. You, you want to you want to keep a difference between those, and it's hard to speak about a difference between ineffabilities. It's to preserve that difference without falling into some sort of contradiction about ineffability. That's that's what I find myself struggling with. I get exactly your point. I think I think if I'm if if I'm reading you right, right, that you don't want those two ineffabilities to to collapse and be identified. Yeah. What 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 I hear you're saying, um, and you can correct me, is is that you're looking at there there is. Whether or not the, the mystic is true in saying that the object-subject dichotomy is illusory and, and what we have to emplace it instead with is, is some sort of pure consciousness or some sort of inter or trans subjectivity as, as you refer to it as. But what you were saying is that, that consciousness as it manifests to us certainly seems to have um, some sort of at least at least separation between the, the inner and outer, the subject and the object. And, and therefore, yeah. the system that we must construct as far as we can speak is dealing with that observable and uh, and and testable reality. Um, totally. Yeah. 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 I, it, this came out in, re, in the recent. I don't know if you got to see it. Um, the discussion I had at length with Bern, Bernardo Castro about mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. um, and be, because you know because he has a, 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 a monism of consciousness idea, but he 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 also tries to account for you know I don't want uh, there's a problem there's there like. Um, what, 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 what am I trying to say? I, I'm generally, I, this is too strong of a, too strong of a, of an adjective, but I'm generally hostile to reductionisms, uh, because they tend to make the level at which we are making our law knowledge claims illusory. And then that becomes for me, I mean, this is the pragmatist in me, that becomes a performative contradiction. You say, this place from which I'm doing all my knowledge claims is an illusion. And then that's like, well, then, right? Then you, then the, the thing you're making claims about should be equally illusory, right? Yeah. And so that's the issue that I'm sort of grinding against here. Does yeah. that make sense to you? Yeah, so because I... Because I use this as an argument against sort of uh, materialist reductionism. Because yeah. I say... If the scientist and the gauges and the experiment are all illusions, then the claims about the fundamental real thing down there are also equally illusions. Yes. The information here has to be real if yes. the knowledge yes. based on it is real. Yeah. What 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 I think what I think I'm trying to get at, um, and 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 I wonder if this is something which which you will resonate with, is a point which emerges I think in in the maturest forms, and I mean that both chronologically yeah. and conceptually of mysticism, both East and West. And I see this in, in forms of Mahayana following directly from the thought of Nagarjuna, who's, who's just a, a, yeah, a yeah, brilliant, yeah. brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, metaphysician. Uh, Dojin too, I think. Dojin, Dojin as well, yeah. And, and what, what comes out of Pure Land and Rin Science and, and, and what also comes out of my own Hasidic tradition, which is a very long, slow evolution of really pushing the logic of mysticism to its furthest. I think that, that the mystic... Uh, and this this is a statement which bends my own mind, and I can say the words, but I, I can't really understand what I'm saying. That that the mystic m proposes a a, a non-duality between the realms of the absolute, where the subject and object is not differentiated, and the realm of of everyday waking consciousness, where those are differentiated, yeah, yeah, and those yeah. two are somehow one as well. Um, yeah. And that's yeah. kind of the edges of my of my grips. Yeah, I am resonant with that, but like you, I. Uh... I, I, I think I'm resonating with it, and the resonance is is one of agreement. But I'm not. I I, I, hard, I find it hard to articulate exactly what it is I'm agreeing with. Right. I mean, I've I, I've I, I've undergone. I don't like this word. It's too useless. I've undergone experiences. And it's transformative experiences that it that give me an indication about what you are ascending towards there. And yeah. I feel like yeah. those experiences ascend in the same way and at this towards the same target. Um, I'm not even gonna use the word object because that's yes. misplaced. Yes. yes. But but I but I mean I'm ultimately and maybe this is where our concerns diverge. Maybe not, because I, I I'm ultimately I I want to know in what way that rarefied air, uh, if you'll allow me to punt, genuinely inspires real people in their real lives because I ultimately want to alleviate the meaning crisis. Uh, and right, yes. it, it, I don't, I don't want, I don't want. I mean, so one of the, you know, this one of the perennial problem, one of the perennial critiques of mysticism is as you get this more more mature uh, claims, uh, um, you. There's, there could be a, a, an elitism evolved that this yeah. becomes inaccessible 
and, and therefore transformatively yeah. useless to most people. Yeah. That's why I'm attracted to people like Eckhart. Yeah, because of his capacity to somehow he's like I, when I read his sermons, I get I like I go really he's going out in the German countryside and giving these sermons, and yeah. the people are like, what's going on? I have to sit down and reflect on this for like a long time. Yeah. But I get that to, I don't disbelieve the claims that he was like charismatic and like like loved. So yes. that that's the issue. That's the issue I, for me. I so I so appreciate that that criticism. Um, and and I think I think I think that I, I I agree with you deeply on that point, um, and I'm very much inspired in terms of thinking mysticism in the lines of William James, where yes. where there must be fruits and and the, sort of the conversation today how it's about not about states but about traits and about transformation yeah, and yeah. and that's I think that's yeah. so important, and I think I think I think that mysticism, the, the way basically I've been framing mysticism just to give a heuristic is is experience theory and practice. Um, and right. experience could a better word maybe awareness that's 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 uh, that's that's yeah, Bernard yeah, yeah. McGinn's term uh, and theory includes all of the the, the metaphysics the theologies the mythology the yeah. sciences and then practice is both the techniques and the ethic and and I think and I think the the ethic of oh, mysticism yeah I think I think the ethic I think there's an ethical imperative I just it's funny I just gave a class uh, two nights ago on, on mysticism and ethics because um, on the one hand, there's, there's no ethic in mysticism because it transcends good and evil, but but yeah. but, but I think that ultimately the, the 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 ethical imperative is, and this is the proposition which I think this is the only proposition which I think mysticism puts forth and must put forth, is that all of reality is somehow fundamentally one unified, interdependent, interconnected, or non-dual, what, however you want to frame it, and the ethic therefore is to treat the rest of reality as if it is no other than I because it is part of myself. Or there's no self at all, and it's all however it's phrased. And and I think that imperative is so important. And I think I want to respond with a, with a critique on your work is that whenever I speak of mysticism, I speak of love because I think love is what emerges necessarily and logically and and morally from mysticism. And and the only time I heard you speak of love in your series was was very philosophical and very abstract, and and not and not love that that motivates action and and, and good way. And, and okay, well, okay. Um... Um, well, two, a, a, a couple things about that. Um, first of all, uh, I'm interested, in, and this is like a question, I'm interested in the relate, because uh, uh, phenomenologically and functionally, psychologically, people do experience something that's beyond good and evil, but nev nevertheless, you, it's, it's, I call it ontonormativity. People, they feel it is deeply right, but not the same thing as, you know, moral right. I, and I'm allowing you the distinction between morality and ethics, right? Uh, right? The, it could, such that they basically say, all right, I'm going to transform all of my life so that I'm closer and more in contact with that. And, and the only reason they give for that, the only justification that they take it as sufficient is that's more real. Yeah. Right. That's why I call it onto normativity and, yes. and, and they transform their life. And there's, uh, so uh, I'm very interested in this beyond good and evil ethic of trying to conform. And I think that might, that might converge. I hadn't thought about this. I'm thinking about it right now. That might converge with, a claim that reality is ultimately something to which we can conform, which means reality ultimately has to be integrated in some profound fashion. I think that might follow, and I hadn't thought about that, so I want to I, I want to put that out as something uh, I, I want to consider. I, I, I thank you. Yeah. I, I hadn't thought about that that there that there that there is an ontological correspondence to ontonormativity, which I think your proposition is, is pointing to on the on the love issue. Uh, um, I do talk a lot about reciprocal opening and that reciprocal opening is the experience of love. And then I tried to talk about that in connection with agape. Um, and I see th this wasn't an argument I, I made well. So I think the criticism is legit that you just made. Um, uh, but you know, your, your, the, your works, are like, I'm talking, you know, you, you do this stuff and they're like, they're like your children. Right, yeah. you you produce them and you come back. And, I still love you, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so because I'm 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 doing a lot on this right now. Like I just want you know this this is an amazing book, Returning to Reality, uh, uh, Christian Platonism by Paul Dyson, wow. and he's yeah. you know Christian Platonism for our time, and, and I'm very interested. I'm very inter interested in this historical confluence, and I think you see similar things. I think I could make a good case. Uh, for something similar happening within Sufism. I don't know. I suspect there might be a similar case within Kabbalah, but I'm not going to presume. I'm not going to presume. I'm going to look, but uh, right? Uh, wh whereas you've got, if, if this is a little bit crude, but just to, to get the gist of my idea. 
you know, the Platonic tradition is basically emphasizing logos and the reciprocal opening of logos. And then Christianity is emphasizing the reciprocal opening of, of agape. And the reason why, why Christian Platonism keeps becoming the predominant thing or Sufism, where people are trying to bring these two together is because they need each other. I think they're interpenetrating. Um, and such that I would say that, I mean, if you'll allow me a little bit of a slogan to be provocative, there's no logos without agape and there's no agape without logos. Yes. Um, and, and so that's sort of where I'm at now. And admittedly, you're right. That wasn't where I was two years ago when I was doing Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. But that's that's much closer to where I am now in my in my reflection upon these things. Yeah. So I, I love that you brought up. Um, yeah. Firstly, like <laughs> there's definitely I definitely understand that there's there's both a love and a, and, and feelings of of regret and remorse to things that we do in the past but, but that's part of the process and I, I i'm learning that as well now when i look back at my stuff i try i try not look back at my older stuff it's it's just it's difficult but um i i, I love that you brought up onto normativity and i i have three pages i've actually i'm looking at the page and i have six pages of notes that i prepared for this conversation from when you said yes till now and <laughs> By the pace of things, I don't think we're going to get to any of those notes, which is fine. Like, I think that's great. Well, why don't you agree to come on and we'll do part two and we'll do a Voices with Raveki for my channel. That would be an absolute pleasure. You, absolutely. Yeah. You got me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So in the notes, I had unsnormativity, which I wanted to discuss with you. Um, and, I'll, I'll, you know, whether we get to whether we get through the notes or not, I'm going to send you like a chapter heading, some of the things which please, I want to talk about. Please, please. Please. Yeah. It, was, it was basically just... Uh, I wanted to sort of set up for you to to give a presentation of your of your of your theory in in large, um, and and then and then some of my, some of my own questions and 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 feedback. But um, in in terms of the resonance between 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 the ethic and and the ontology, I, I think I think that's one hundred percent the case. Firstly, this yeah. is not my own argument. This is an argument which uh, has put has been put very well by a recent scholar of Jewish mysticism, a brilliant scholar, Elliot Wolfson. Um, in his book called Venturing Beyond, which talks about, um, he, he coins a phrase which is hyper, um, hypernomianism, where, where, it's, where, it's, where it's beyond nomos, it's beyond the law. And he's speaking about that both in terms of Jewish halachic law and also um, ethical or moral law. And, and, um, and he, he makes the case based on earlier thinkers that, that, um, that to go, he, he's, a, he's a postmodernist by language, and, and so he makes these funny lines like, uh, to go to go to walk beyond the law one must walk the law or like whatever they say like some some of these like right, right, right. double double t tones but but i think my 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 understanding of mysticism um and, and i think there's sort of a very simple occam's razor to this argument is is that the is that the ethic um is no different than the metaphysic and and the, and, and the resonance there is is absolute and it's 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 simple enough for a child to understand um and and i think and i think that there's that there's that there's good reason for that which is that the the simple the simple metaphysical proposition that that reality is one, which is which is an empirical experience for the mystic themselves, mandates a a relationship to reality like a relationship to ourselves. So that so that when so that when the Bible says that I shall love thy neighbor as thyself, the mystics read it, and this is what the Jewish mystics do. They they take the chaf, which means like sometimes. Or it means as, and they say, love the neighbor as thyself because it is thyself. And 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 the verse there in, in Leviticus ends, uh, Ki Hashem lokecha, for I am the Lord thy God. And, and the mystics say, it is because of the unity that we are in God, who in whom we move and live and have our being, yeah. not that they say that, that right. uh, that, that mandates the Avihav and, and the and the, 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 the obligation and, and the metaphysic and the ethic are, are so deeply intertwined to the extent that they're no longer eats when that becomes clear and obvious, there no longer needs to be an obligation. We're not when there's this idea in, in the Talmud that that in the messianic phase, which the mystics read on a personal level, right in one's in one's own nirvana, there is no more commandments. That's the Talmud says mitzvot betelot la tilavo that there's no more commandments when when the Messiah comes. Which like the the halachic thinkers all have like break their heads on how can they end? They're supposed to be immutable and eternal. And the mystics say, of course they no longer need to be commanded because it's your own very nature to follow the nature of reality, which is yeah, to treat right, everything right. as one. So, yeah. so, so that's, that's, I think that's the case 100% here. So that, that's very interesting. I, I mean, I, I think that's right. I think that's a, that's a central claim. Um, I'm trying to, I'm seeking a point of convergence here because you brought up postmodernism. Um, um, now I only, I'm, I, I don't like it when people, 
lump postmodernists together as if they're all saying the same thing. I think that's ridiculously unfair. Uh, so I'm, I, I've read and I'm familiar, especially with Derrida, somewhat with Foucault. Um, and so uh, also Rorty, but uh, uh, that, that, that doesn't, Rorty does not impress me the way Derrida and Foucault do, but that's another discussion for another time. Uh, but here's the, here's the thing. So, so Plato seems to argue that, um, you know, that, like I said, we have these two meta drives, we seek inner peace, and we seek that whatever's giving us inner peace is real. And we seek, so we seek fundamental uh, reality and, and inner peace. And, and you can show that, you can show that again in simple experiences. I think I relate the experience, and I do this in my classes regularly. How many of you are in really satisfying romantic relationships, you put up your hands, how many would want to know that if your partner was cheating on you, even if it would destroy the relationship? And, you know, 95 to 100% put up their hands. Mm -hmm. So they prefer, Yes. they'll, they'll sacrifice their subjective well-being and their sense of contentment and peace because it's not real. Yes. Right? And so, that, so please keep that on sort of one hand. And then the other hand, uh, the, the movie Joker, right? And, and, and so... There's, there, there is a potential, and, and you, I, I think you can see this at the end of L'Etranger by Camus, there's, an, there's a potential sort of oneness um, in, in absurdity, um, that the absurd within and the absurd without can become just one absurdity. Uh, and it strikes me that that, uh, which is, I think, sort of the ultimate triumph of sort of a kind of nominalism, uh, but I think that oneness, um, which... And again, at the end of The Stranger, it, it has mystical overtones. And you know that Camus wrote his thesis on Neoplatonism, right? Christian Neoplatonism. Mm -hmm. no, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, and that's why, that's why the light is such a big thing in Camus, right? mm -hmm. and why the light hits, uh, mm -hmm. what's the, the character's name before he, before he, he kills the Arab, right? Um, so what I'm saying is, is it, is, it, it's a, is it sufficient to pause that monism or is it to, do we need an intelligent, I don't mean graspable, but a monism that is a continual fount of intelligibility and connectedness for us, right? In order for that love that you're saying to follow from the monism. So what I'm saying is strictly speaking, does love follow from monism or does it follow from a specific, from a species of monism in which intelligibility and connection are real rather than absurd? empty yeah nihilistic. yeah so so that's that's a very interesting question firstly the 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 proposition about truth is definitely true and, and i think that's bore out by uh by what's the the eudaimonia thought experiment the eudaimonia machine yeah. um yeah. Yeah. i i i think this is an interesting question and 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 this is where this is actually listening to your lectures thinking about this point was quite challenging for me in, in the best of ways because because of of what i i hear a lot of uh, insistence on an Aristotelian conception of of being and its relationship to thought, yeah, um, yeah. as opposed to something which I myself, I mean, I, I, something I, I I myself had a bit of a different conception. There's there's a there's a long debate within medieval Jewish philosophy between Neoplatonists and Aristotelians and other Jewish thinkers, yeah, where where they specifically reject Aristotle's metaphysics because Aristotle and following him Maimonides and many others posit the highest principle as the active intellect, right? As, as, yeah. as, yeah. as and Neoplatonism goes beyond because the one is even beyond being. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. The, the one is not only beyond wisdom, it's beyond being. And, and this same, the same philosophical issue plays out in the Kabbalists where, where within their spherotic chart, which is their great chain of being, right. or at least one iteration of it, yeah. um, Chachma, which corresponds to, to the active intellect, um, is not the, is not the highest sphere. There's this Keter right. and, and there's no. beyond. Yeah. Um, and, and and the Jewish Neoplatonists, like Ibn Gabriel, for that reason, have to posit will above above intellection, and and for right. that same reason, a, a, Jew, a later Jewish thinker like like the Maharal has to criticize his uh, early conceptions of 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 Jewish Aristotelian theologies because they limit God to to intellect to intellectuality, yeah. Yeah. and and and, yeah. and 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 so 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 that's something which so that's something which 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 I would object to based on my own sort of Neoplatonic and and and, and mystical yeah, yeah. inclination that, that that God and and reality and being is more than just um, is more than just intellection and and to say beyond being is is is, is I mean almost such a difficult phrase to say it, it yeah. it's it's no, almost agree, meaningless but but um so 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 I think I think the conflation of being 
And the, I actually want to, maybe I'll pose this to you as a question. The conflation of, of, of being and thinking or being in truth or being in and knowing that, that, that you pose, which I think has that Aristotelian blend to it, is that to, is that to, to, to limit being to intellect, intellectuality, or is it to extend knowing to being, which is, which is beyond it? Um, and, and I think that may, I think that may answer, I'll be able to answer the question of, 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 of the ethic of love based, based on perhaps in that. That's oh, very good. Very good. That's an excellent response. That's a good counter question. Um, uh, so let me sure, make, make sure I understand the question. Am I, am I equating being with the ground of intelligibility and it's ultimately graspable in an act of intellection? Or is, it, is there a kind of knowing that moves beyond intellection and therefore beyond being understood as intelligibility. That's how I would put it. Is, is that like what you were saying to me or? What, what I mean. Because I hear Aristotle as ultimately finally s stopping at the, the, the point of Parmenides, even though Parmenides has a one. His is right that knowing and being are, right. that intelligibility is, it, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the ceiling. Of the maybe, maybe I can phrase it like this: Is is there in your conception? Is there a being which is beyond knowing, and not 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 beyond human knowing, beyond beyond knowing? Period. Is there a being beyond? Well, I, I well, let me let me say first that I do think the ground of being is not any kind of being. Um, uh, and absolutely, absolutely right. pardon me, it's not it's not a being, right? That's not it's, it's not a being, right. and I think that the one is yeah the 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 the, the one is not intelligible bec precisely because it's the fount or ground of intelligibility right right in a similar right. way it is not being and this is a neoplatonic argument because it is the ground of and it, the explanation of yes. the unity that we find within being yes uh, but but, the, but, the, but this question is hard to answer because the neoplatonic tradition says uh, there's something like a union with the one is possible. Yes. And I take that, that to be something like the culmination of what I call participatory knowing, which is knowing by identity rather than knowing by right pers perspective. Uh, and sure. the reason why I do that is because I want there to be continuity between participatory knowing and perspectival knowing and procedural knowing and propositional knowing, or you're just going to create this dichotomy within the individuals whereby that act of unity can't be translated into the transformative experiences within people's lives. So that's my concern. Okay. So that's, that's so good. Um, I, I, I would want to challenge you to, and, and this is something which I wanted to challenge you the whole time while listening to the series. Um, <laughs> If if there's a if there's a way of union and even union by identity, which 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 roundly goes beyond knowing, which is still transformable to the human life, um, and to the, there's there's a there's a there's a text from from the Zohar which is bouncing around my head, which uh, you know one the, uh, the classic text of Jewish mysticism, which is late machshavat fisabli kal avonitvas yuberosivliba that no in the Aramaic no mind at all can grasp God because God is beyond, uh, yeah, yeah. but but God is grasped with the with the strivings, the yearnings, the 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 soarings of the heart. Yeah, yeah. That that yeah. there's something in being and and in human being, um, which which goes beyond our simple. Which I shouldn't say simple. I take that back. Which goes beyond our our our, our knowings, as as far as you want to extend that. There's something in the human which which itself is ineffable, and that ineffable thing is it. Plotinus says that it doesn't become identified with the one. It it, it always was, and always is. That just becomes revealed yeah, to us. True. So, so, so whenever I hear you speaking and, and I hear you capping it at, at, at a, at a union through, through identification, through, through, through the fourth form of knowing, whatever it is, but, but maybe there's something which is just beyond that entirely, which is just the very, um, substance of being itself, essence of being, which is already one. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a, I mean, I, I, I guess I'd need more to know what that dichotomy between those are. Uh, because the analogy I have, and it's only meant as an analogy, is, you know, I know I'm conscious by being conscious. And I mean, it, to, to be fair to me, that's the analogy that Plotinus often uses repeatedly, right? Like he points to that state and he says, you know, that state, that's what I'm talking about. And it's like, yeah, uh, but you only mean it as an analogy because you also keep telling me it's an analogy. Um, and so I want to make clear that when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about something 
that is necessarily like presentable within your consciousness. Mm. I'm talking about something that's, I mean, uh, that that's, and I, 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 I do try to make that clear when I talk about like, this is at the, the level of your existential mode. This is, mm. you know, this is at the level of your being in the world at which this transformation is occurring. Yeah. That's why I don't use consciousness. I use the term agent arena relationship. Yes, so I'm yeah. trying to talk to something that actually makes possible the affordances that consciousness ultimately relies on. So I am pointing to something very deep within our ontology. And I have said that, you know, maybe it's analogous and I don't mean any dis disrespect. I think you know that I'm very respectful of religion. I, I do, like, I do uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 I, and I think justifiably so. As, as am I. Yeah, 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 it's true. <laughs> and I share that with you. Uh, so I think you, you, you'll, you'll, re you'll understand me charitably. I've said, I, I, you know, I think of the soul as a precisely that capacity in us to relate the moreness and the suchness, the, the suchness of the, of, you know, of the individual thing that's non-categorical precisely in its pure here-ness, now-ness, right? Yeah. And, and the moreness that, that, you know, the inexhaustible, you know, oneness from which everything comes. And the soul is yeah. that within us, which grounds us a, 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 a both ways. Yes. I'm sorry, these are just spatial metaphors, but I, I understand. And, and, and I, so, at, I, and I'm talking about it at something like, that's not properly even psychological. I, I think of it as psychoontological. That's what, that's what I mean. Participatory knowing for me bridges between everything properly cognitive and it, 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 it bridges into the biological and ultimately through the biological, I think into the ontological. Um, so it depends. It, like I'm not trying to point to the, 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 the problem I have, and this is part of the issue. This is part of the polemic of four E cognitive science is we want people to broaden what they mean by cognition to include yes, emotion, exactly. connection, exactly. participation, embeddedness, yes. and that, that all of our mind. And now that term is really being stretched yes. it, 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 it is in these ontological dimensions and it's not the compute it's not reducible to or even ultimately explainable in terms of just the computations in our head yes. so i'm trying to point to something with a much more comprehensive ontological dimensionality within which that participatory knowing is occurring now if you ask me if there's anything beyond that i i i, I don't know i i i i'm just i'm ignorant Right, I, 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 and uh, uh, like, and, and and please be fair to me. I, you know, I'm somebody who's practiced deeply, practices, right, for you know, close to three decades now. Um, and so, um, I, I I don't think I'm necessarily naive about the richness of the, uh, of, of transformative experience. Yes. Uh, but I I don't know, I, and I'm trying to be fair to. I don't know if I can. If I can go beyond what I've just articulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, firstly, firstly, I have to acknowledge that that I that I am not so aware with with cognitive science in general. Um, yeah. And 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 with with your own sort of understanding of, of what of what these terms mean beyond how they've been, and I'm probably stuck with a layman's perspective on what these terms mean, and therefore trying to push them yeah. further and, and I, I definitely appreciate that and I appreciate in, in general I appreciate your 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 humility and and your 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 generosity in, in thinking it's really it's really incredible um thank you um yeah in in, a, in like in a, in a really humbling and inspiring way I think I think that um Totally forgot what I was supposed to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was what was the very last thing you said? It'll, it'll bring it back to me. Oh, the, the the argument I was trying to make is like when I'm talking about cognition, yeah. right, or at least in, in the participatory knowing sense. I'm I'm really expanding the ontological dimensions yes. of that, yes. and yes. if I'm saying when I'm talking about participatory, right, uh, like I'm not talking about something that is just like sort of realized in, even in your consciousness, right? It's real. It has to. It's realized more, right? You know, in the notion of soul. I'm given a cognitive scientific yes. reading to soul, yes. right, yes. Uh, about embeddedness and enacted. But I'm also saying that, and and, and this is not unfair because. Cognitive science is deeply influenced by Heidegger, 
I think that also has to do with, you know, the soul is the thing that grounds us in the moreness and the suchness. Um, and, and that grounding is not taking place um, in, in what you might call my intellect or in my consciousness. It, 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 make, it grounds them. Yes. It makes them possible. Yeah. And so I'm definitely pointing to something that's trans-egoic and trans-intellect trans intellectual and yeah. even trans yeah. consciousness yeah. but if you ask me is it something even more trans than that right. i i don't know and that's okay. that, and, 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 and that's where i come to yeah okay so 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 certainly if, if that's the case um then 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 it's not what, what where i th where i was thinking that your thinking was was being was being intentionally capped at is, is, is certainly not the case and certainly um much beyond that uh, it could just be that I was being sort of confused by 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 that by that language usage. Um, well, I could have been confusing too. That's quite possible. So. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I think I think I think the soul is a very is a very apt metaphor, and I think it's great to be to be borrowing and and re sort of refilling religious language. Um, and if if we can think of the soul as something like to use to use a word which is philosophically dubious as as the essence. Of yeah. of the individual, which is beyond just the individual, um, then certainly and 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 certainly according to the mystic's own admission, it, it is that that essence of the, of the of the of the person of their being, which is what connects them and what unites them, which is which because it's not other than 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 the soul of God, the essence of God, and that's that's certainly that's certainly certainly um, a, a fair point, and particularly particularly that notion which which I think is very I, I heard you quoted from from William Blake. That it's the uh, to see eternity in hour and in infinity in, in yeah. a, in a, in a, yeah. to see the to world see the of the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. Well, that's so that's. I mean, it it sounds it it seems to me it seems to me now like we're not really we're not really talking about something all that different. Um, and as well, I, I share I share your concern here that some of this discussion may go beyond a level of of practical or, or applicability where where it gets lost in in in, in acrobatic abstractions and uh, and loses its focus on on real world application and its ability to transform lives for the better and in your case to emerge from the meaning crisis uh, i think i maybe phrase it as uh, in perhaps more of an ethical term as moving the world to a place of care and kindness and, and whatnot yeah but um yeah, yeah. In, 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 de deeply deeply interconnected i'm sure so so yeah so i, so I think it may, i think it may be be a point where where that where that level of um of abstraction may 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 be not even necessary or i mean i and, and i think there's i think there's also real importance for an epistemological um humility which is to say, like, to, 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 which is to say that now we begin to speak of the mysteries, which we have no idea of what we talk. Um, yeah. But 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 to have those experiences and and to and to be able to express them in compelling narratives for a contemporary world, I think I think is the real challenge. Yeah, I I, I think we're in full agreement there. I mean, one thing that excites me, and I think this is now a real possibility rather than a utopic fantasy or anything like that is the ability to not only express it in narratives, which I'm not saying we should start do it, stop doing, uh, but to do something that is analogous to what we've seen throughout the history, which is to express it in terms that I think are accessible and consistent. I don't, I don't say reducible to, but ac accessible and um, consistent with, you know, the very best cognitive science we have. Yes. Uh, because I think, I mean, I make this argument and I think if we do not, do that, we will still be unhomed from our worldview in a very powerful way. And yes. no matter how profound our experiences might be and how much, and I, and I don't want to deny this, how much, you know, existential and ethical fruit they might bear, I think it's not going to ultimately at the cultural cognitive level uh, ameliorate nihilism in the way it needs to be ameliorated yes. unless we can offer significant challenge to a version of scientism, not science, but a version of scientism that keeps pointing to the fact, I think legitimately, by the way, that our current worldview in no way homes us. Yes. And unless we can rehome us and the mystical experiences into that worldview, doesn't mean that worldview shouldn't be challenged or changed. It should. We've already talked about Foreman, you know, for all of our critiques of him, he had an impact on the cognitive science of consciousness, right? Um, 
So I think of it more of like a reciprocal reconstruction. But that, re that reciprocal reconstruction has to take place yes. between cognitive science and, and the, what, if you'll allow me a, a neutral term, I hope, the language of mysticism. Yeah. Those have yeah. to engage in reciprocal reconstruction. Or I yeah. do not think the existential and existential fruits, the existential and ethical fruits are going to be sufficient for bringing about the cultural transformation that is badly needed right now because yeah. we are yeah. suffering. Yeah. Catastrophically yeah. from the media yes. crisis. Yes, I, I, um, I think. Well, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of uh, resonances to Jeffrey Kripal's work, um, in in the flip on a, on a similar vein. There, I think I, I might just, I might just add to in agreement to what you're saying, but I might just add to say that that I think even, even the science itself, the only reason why why that is an important thing to do is because. The narrative of today is the narrative of science, right? That that science yeah. itself is, is is the narrative, and and therefore that that we, it's the narrative of, of facts and science, or, or whatever it is that there yeah. has to be, or exper yeah. you know experimentation. I'm I'm curious I'm curious whether I should even um, bother like reading my introduction to you that I planned <laughs> to do an hour ago, <laughs> and <laughs> and and follow up with the whole course, or if I should just skip to my questions. What what do you think is best here? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I'm just happy how this is going. So, you know, I don't mean to sound too California, but just, you know, organically, what seems to be appropriate to you right now, rely on your relevance realization. Yeah. Um, how should, how should we go forward? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to my questions then. It's, it's so funny actually, because like I pose, I have like a list of questions here. The first one's like a formality. It's like, what, what should yeah. I call you? Is it John or is it Dr. Viveki <laughs> or is it like, oh, just please call me John. I asked my students to call me John as well. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, 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 my, my maxim is I, I want to earn people's respect, not feel entitled to it. Nice, nice, nice. I really, I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you with reading your own biography here. I'll, I'll read, I'll record this separately and, and I'll clip it onto the beginning. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm experimenting with, with. So I have some questions about your own work. Um, about about your journey, about about things like that, and yeah. and questions which I think are going to tie right back into the conversation we've been having up until now. It's not going to be disjointed. Um, I have an experimental question which I haven't yet tried with any of my interviewees, but okay. but I, I I like to try it with you. It might be fun. Imagine this was like the beginning of the conversation, or or not. Uh, and instead of instead of introducing you, I'd like to ask you, who are you? Who am I? Huh. Um, that's the, that's the ultimate Socratic question. I'm somebody who aspires to be, and I want to really emphasize that aspires. I'm somebody who aspires to be as a, 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 the kind of lover of wisdom that I see in Socrates. Um, the kind of love or, or lover of others I see in Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and the kind of lover of reality that I see in people like Spinoza and Plotinus. Wow, that was that was uh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, and I and I know that that each one of those statements is, has like means so much to you and is so thought out to you, and each one of those terms means means so much to you. Um, I think that worked. Actually, I felt like some sort of intimacy here through through the screen. Some sort of, sort of yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. I think that actually worked. I might I might go forward with asking people this absurd question, which is impossible to answer. Um, yeah, so so just to go through them, a lover of wisdom, like um, like Socrates. Socrates. Can you can you give us can you give us a, a one foot definition of of what you mean by wisdom? So what I mean by wisdom is uh, a reliable and systemic, meaning through all of the person's psyche, not just isolated components, a reliable and systemic capacity to overcome self-deception and enhance um, connectedness to oneself, to other people, and to the world. Can you, do you mind repeating that one more time? Uh, yeah, a reliable and systemic capacity uh, to overcome self-deception and enhance connectedness to oneself, to other people and to the world. Nice, that's really beautiful. And I, and I see how like, how the three loves which you articulated are really not three separate things. They're really, they're really one and the same. Yeah. That's really cool. It's really, it's really, I mean, I, I, just, I, I mean, by, by either identity or by projection, 
I understand what it means to to like try to like come from one place with very fixed dogmas and and things that are set up for you to to embark on a journey to to really try and and think critically for oneself about about what's 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 best and what's principled and what's meaningful and and grounding and propelling for oneself in life. Um, so so I, I I like salute that and and respect that. I. Thank you. I'd I'd be curious to I'd be curious if you're if you're open to share a little about about what it was like to grow up in a fundamentalist Christian uh, community and family and then to uh, discover the thinkers you did. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I've spoken of it elsewhere. I mean, I've cultivated, and I think that's the right verb, I've cultivated a deep ambivalence about that because I've come to regard, I, like the way we talk about having a mother tongue, I, I think we have a mother religion, which can also be secularism, by the way. Um, that it, that has because of its place in our developmental progression has just a huge uh, just has a, a titanic impact compared to all, 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 everything else. It's not it's not that you won't you know it's not that you can't learn other languages and even learn to study Russian literature or something like that. But for me, English will always have a kind of precedence and priority. That that's just because how I came into things and and it's the same thing um, that um, that fundamentalist Christianity. Was my mother religion, and therefore it. it, it I, although this might sound like a simple phrase, it's not a simple thing. I'm. I'm very grateful for the taste for religion that it gave me. Mm, yes, I understand that. Now, that's and, and I want I like graphically attach a lot of weight to that because I'm really trying to argue for an ambivalence here. But on the other side, was real trauma, mm. and I mean that in the psychological sense. I don't mm. mean it just. Yeah. Metaphorically, I mean, I, 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 I remember experiencing moments of, of absolute terror. I remember I came home, I, I think I've related this story elsewhere. I came home and I was, I don't know, 11 or something, and I was still totally immersed in fundamentalism, fundamentalist Christianity. And normally there was always somebody in my house, it was a small house. Um, and so, like, you bumped into people all the time and uh, my family, and there was nobody home. Mm. And I thought the rapture had occurred and I had been left behind. Wow. And this was absolute evidence that I was evil and that the devils were going to come and get me. Wow. And How I, old were you at the time? I think about 10 or 11. Wow. And, and that's just one example. Uh, here's another example. I remember I read in the New Testament about the unforgivable sin. And, uh, and then I became convinced uh, almost, almost at the level of OCD right that i had committed it mm. um and then and uh, and then i was just absolutely terrified and I, I couldn't eat i couldn't sleep and my mother saw my distress uh and she took me to the minister mm. um and uh, you know and i was looking for a resolution to this and and he gave me a tepid vague answer about as long as you have faith don't worry mm. like and it was like what you you built this whole machine and it it's like this pyramid and it's pivoting on me right at this point and then it's like woo, 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 woo. and you know and that was close to when I started uh, considering abandoning this mm -hmm. and that th those are not exclusive those are just examples sure. they're examples sure. of repeated kinds of events mm -hmm. and then there were background things there were background things about you know uh, and, but part of it was the Christianity part of it was uh, you know, uh, the idiosyncratic psychodynamics of my mother and my father, but there was also the, you know, the, the, the vilification of sexuality. Mm. Um, and there, and there was, like, I remember, and it took me a while once I was free and looking back the way I had viewed anybody that was not a Christian or outside the church as if they were the embodiment of evil and practicing evil things mm. all day long. Mm. And I realized, Oh, like there was this almost paranoid conspiracy mm. that was running through all of my thinking. So there were these, there was those background things like that. And then there's these traumatic moments. So there's background distortion and then there's acute trauma um, and that, um, that ultimately just got uh, noxious to me to the point where the, there was a pivot point and mm, I, you know, uh, the, I don't want to anthropomorphize my psyche, but it was like, you, 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 you gotta, you're either going to die from this or you're going to live another way. Right. Uh, and, 
And I, you know, and I didn't make that decision consciously initially. What happened is I was exposed to some literature that opened up to me possibilities of alternative ways of thinking about human being and ontology. Uh, and then that started a, a journey uh, for me. And then very quickly, I ran into the figure of Socrates and that uh, sort of oriented me in a very, uh, very, very powerful um, and particular way. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was very, very, uh, like I said, ambivalent. I, I've come to be grateful for the taste for religion. Um, so I often get people say to me that I, 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 I'm very paradoxical. Um, I seem like a very religious thinker without having any particular religion. And I'll get, and I've had a, a couple of Christians say to me recently, I think you're the best Christian I've ever met. And I say, <laughs> I don't know what that means, right? Um, and I think I think what they're putting their finger on, I think, uh, is that, that there's that taste for religion that expresses itself through me in a continual manner. And that is significant and important to me. Uh, but, but, but it came at a heavy cost. It came yeah. at a cost yeah. of the trauma. And so my initial thing was to get, I thought I had to get rid of, I had to get let go of both because they had been so intertwined. Yeah. So to give up the trauma meant to give up the taste. And I became sort of rapidly and uh, militantly atheistic for a considerable period. But then I slowly, and this is largely because of the Platonic tradition, I slowly was able to start to pull them apart mm. and realize that there was a way of addressing this that would not only free me from this, the trauma, but give me some tools mm. with also with some therapeutic tools, right, to deal with this and mm. uh, get some degree of amelioration and alleviation from it. Mm. I hope that's a good answer to your yeah, question. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really great answer. That's a really great answer. I'm just... As someone who, who, who shares elements of both of those, obviously every person's experience is incomparable. Um, yeah. But is there, is there any sense of, I don't know whether from like a secular standpoint, you could call it some sort of fatalism where, where, where you sort of retrospectively accept the, the bad for the good that came with it? Is there, is there any sense of that? Um. No, because I think that would hamstring the critique that I think should be made mm. of those features that tra continue to traumatize people, mm. even people that I know directly. Mm. Um, so I would want to say, no, there's a legitimate place from which to make that critique in order to help reduce the suffering and distress right. and the trauma that is still being inflicted right. on people. Right. right. And, and, and I mean, I think concomitant to that is, is the fact that one can be instilled, one can instill children with a sense for the for the religio without traumatizing them right yes i think so one one way of reducing all of my work is to is to exactly that hope that rational hope that we can give people ways to access and accentuate religio without traumatizing them that's mm. exactly i think for me that's the pivot point around awakening from the meaning crisis it, yes. I would say if that hope is not realizable, then I do not think there is a way of bringing people out of the meaning crisis. Because I think the way people are being traumatized by the meaning crisis is exactly structurally, functionally analogous to the way fundamentalism has tra is tra has traumatized and continued to traumatize individuals. Yeah, and and I think I think maybe to even extend it a bit further, I think that that project on the individual level is what needs to happen for humanity as a whole, emerging from our own yeah. traumatic experience with religion historically. Um, and and fundamentalism and, and all that. Um, well, thank you, thank you for thank you for sharing that. I mean, it must not be easy to to sort of revisit those those things. I'm glad. I hope this it doesn't come off as uh, self congratulatory. I'm glad you're asking me that question now rather than t even ten years ago, mm -hmm. even five years ago, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe even two years ago. I mean, I I feel like m my ability to more properly get into a right relationship with my past is being afforded by the conversations I'm having with uh, religious people of good faith. And I mean that in both senses of the term yes, good faith. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, uh, I mean, it, it's it's difficult and, and I'm still paying the price for it. I mean, it still comes up like in, in I, I can still see those patterns coming up in fr friendships or my romantic relationships in ways that have been deleterious, costly to me and costly to the people that I've been in relationship with that I've come to regret. Yeah. Um, but, but, and I'm not trying to make an excuse. Uh, I, I've tried to make amends where possible. 
Yeah. Um, so I take it seriously, but it, yeah, it's difficult because you have to, it, it's it, like the worst thing is to retreat. And this, this is kind of a bit of a cultural critique. The worst thing in the face of trauma is to retreat into the safety of being the victim. Yes. Uh, sure. Right. Sure. Um, because to me, um, that isn't the, that isn't the full and final kind of way of responding to trauma. You ultimately have to take a, a deep kind of responsibility for it yes. um, by learning to live in a way that reduces the way, the ways in which you are still promulgating and promoting those patterns unaware to others. Yes. Yeah. That's, I think, I think, I mean, that's, that's, I think that's certainly the case. I, I want to, I want to sort of maybe conclude this segment on with one more word from the heart. Um, and I, I really hope it doesn't come off as patronizing in any sense at all. And then get back into the uh, hard headed conversation, which we began with earlier, which, which I think a question, which will lead us right back into it. Um, which I'm very curious to hear your response to, but the, the word which I wanted to say from the heart is that, is that I don't think I'm in a position to, to apologize for, for anyone's religious upbringing or religion at all, or for someone else's religion. But insofar as I do still identify as a religious individual and I do still um, carry that, that title and identity and, and face with me, it's, it, it, it pains me and it's a tragedy to hear every time that, that religion is still being or has been practiced in a, an abusive and a traumatic way. Yeah. Um, so yeah. so in, in far as my apology means anything, I want to apologize on behalf of religion. Well, thank you for that. Um, I, your apology is well received. I appreciate uh, from the, pla the place from which it is given and how it was being given. So thank you for that. Um, I, that means a lot to me. I, I mean, and, and um, like I said, I felt other people of good faith reaching out to me. And as much as I can, while being responsible to my own philosophical and existential and perhaps even spiritual development, um, I try to reciprocate in kind. Um, I try to apologize for how, you know, um, you know, a scientific worldview and, and certain things has perhaps harmed people um, unnecessarily uh, within a religious framework. Right. But, but I think I think if anyone, I mean, I think of the few people alive today that are operating within that realm of science in a serious way, uh, you're one which you're you're one person who who is contributing so much to to the religious um, conscious and, and consciousness in, in a way which is really which is really astounding. And I think I think the gift that you're as much as you're stealing from the religion, what you're giving back to it is far more. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad you I'm glad to hear you say that because that that's definitely what I aspire to. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's more people. I mean, there. I mean, I want to make clear that I'm not. I, I, it's not definitely a consensus, but I'm not an isolated individual within 4E cognitive science. There's lots of people within 4E cognitive science, like Gavin Thompson and his right. deep interest in Buddhism and Taoism, right. um, and, and Charles Taylor. Like, there's just a lot of people that uh, are in 4E cognitive science that see that. You can't really, just like we, we, we came to realize you can't properly understand cognition without paying attention to emotion. We're now coming to the deep realization you can't understand cognition and emotion without paying attention to spirituality, whatever right. that term ultimately right. points to. Right. I, think, I think what may set you apart though, and, and may, you still may be the, the target of the appropriate praise is because while you know those individuals that are working very seriously within cognitive science, uh, for you cognitive science, um, there are very few people in the world that, that can that can share that knowledge with you, but because you've taken the time and the effort and the decision to go ahead and turn your information outwards and bring it to the public, in in something which which you know may have not been the the you had so many options of other ways of pursuing and, and spending your time and effort. I think I think in that sense, what 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 you're doing is really is really fantastic. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, it, you're right. The the awakening from the meaning crisis and, you know, untangling the world knot and the elusive eye and voice of the for um, Yeah. It, 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 it takes effort. Um, and, and so I, I do appreciate the gratitude um, and appreciation um, the praise, I guess. Uh, but I, again, I'll, 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 I'll turn this back on you. I'm receiving back much more than I give from this process. I know that. I know that to be the case as well. Yeah. Uh, so, um, 
it's not yeah it, 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 i mean it, yeah you're right it's it's, it's it's far from without cost uh yeah. but yeah. i i i get back my, i mean i wouldn't have met you but they're just a, an example and i'm i'm so pleased that i have gotten to meet you um and i wouldn't have met you know paul vanderclay and i would i wouldn't have met you know jonathan pajot and i wouldn't have met you know guy senstock uh, I, it's i i'm deeply grateful for what what it has given back to me um so i i i very much understand that i very i, I really i really do understand that um in a, in a small scale of being engaged in, in in what i hope is something similar let me let's let let me bring it back to to the question which i wanted to pose i have i have also like a, a list of of 15 or 20 things which which really like picked my ears up during your lectures which i would love to r- run through with you but uh let me let me let me perhaps begin with this question because it might be more substantial than just reading a list of things. Um, you said in your lectures that we need, and you said this repeatedly, so I, I, I see that it's an important point for you, that we need something that will systematically create psychotechnologies that transform consciousness, cognition, character, and culture in a way that religions have in the past if we're going to address the meaning crisis. Yes. Um, so my question to you is, um, and, and perhaps perhaps if I would have just um, paid more attention to the end of the lectures, I wouldn't have to ask you this. So forgive me <laughs> if it's my ignorance. Um, but um, what are those psychotechnologies? And and perhaps an, uh, an addendum to that question is, do you think that we, that we actually reliably can lead people um, through a systematic process to enlightenment, to awakening and transformative experiences? Okay, so the the first one is I, I did try and lay out some specific things, but let me try and but that but again I, I think the work I've done with others has moved beyond that. I think we need so let me let, I don't want to prescribe like this practice or this practice uh, because I, I that is not that's not even how therapy works or education works, right? So instead, I, I want to talk about families or kinds of practices um, and and sort of design features you want in what I call an ecology of practices. And p- I put a lot of emphasis on that idea of an ecology, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, a dynamic system of checks and balances and mutual living, uh, yes. right? Uh, uh, and so I think you need mindfulness practices of some kind. Um, that's an important psychotechnology. I think um, you, and, and these two, these two, and I've published on this and I talk about it at length in the series. So I'll just gesture to it now. You also need active open-mindedness practices and they, they are an opponent processing to each other. Um, I think you need practices of, uh, that coordinate those two together of internalizing the sage. Um, and you can, and, and before that sounds bizarre, uh, that's at the center of Stoicism. You're internalizing Socrates. It's at the center of Buddhism. Um, you know, it's at the center of Christianity. Paul says, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives within me. So that's not something foreign or strange. It comes right out of the world of coaching. And we now have some research, even within the psychology of wisdom, that, you know, internalizing sage-like figures is predictive of people, you know, improving uh, in, in, uh, in in wisdom measures. So uh, you need you need those kind of practices. I think you need... When within mindfulness, you also have a checks and balances. You need meditative practices and contemplative practices because they scale your attention up and down mm-hmm. in opponent processing. You need practices that bridge between mindfulness practices and propositional processing, like Lexio Divina, uh, a, a kind of reading. Uh, and somebody uh, and some of some of uh, self-identified Jewish people have commented that there are similar things to Lexio Divina within the Jewish tradition of how you read a text transformatively rather than informatively Certainly. and you read it collectively and not individually so mm-hmm. i think that okay so th- th- i don't think i'm stepping on ground saying that that seems to be you know broadly applicable so you need and you need you need practices uh like i say that that help bridge uh between the perspectival and the participatory like lexio divina and then you want practices in which you're taking and this is where most of my work is now where you're moving from individual cognition into distributed cognition, you need practices that sort of layer circling um, philosophical fellowship, and, and, and this is meant to be like a spiral, they're layering into what I call dialectic into dialogos, and, and, and that acts as a meta psychotechnology that helps to you to curate and create the ecology of individual or smaller group versions of the ecologies of practices. And I think, um, 
and, and there's more, but I'm, I'm just trying to give a taste uh, uh, for what, what that looks like. Uh, and I think that there's good research to support each one of these. Um, and I think there's some pretty good research. It's not as extensive or as, as you know, moving towards convergence. Although the, the wisdom paper, consensus paper we published in 2019 points towards some of this, right? That, you know, this layered ecologies of practice um, is, is the way to go. And, and the idea that the, the higher, the, the meta psychotechnology is something dialectical and dialogical. I mean, I can point very strongly to that within, of course, the Platonic and Neoplatonic traditions, because you know, dialectic is the highest virtue, yes. right? Um, and I can point to it very clearly within Christian Platonism. I mean, it comes out explicitly in you know, at what I think is a culmination point in John Scotus uh, Eregina, right? Um, and I think I could make a case for something like that, analogous with the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, 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 and I'm not as confident about Sufism or, or Judaism, um, so uh, I, I'm not going to say anything where I don't feel I have appropriate um, expertise. But so, uh, do I, I do I think that um, there that we could have a, a pedagogical program that could bring people into this? Yes. But there's a reason why I call these, like, for example, I say dialectic into dialogos. I think dialectic is a practice you can learn, but it is the practice, like, it's, I, I, I try to use this analogy. You can practice things that will improve your chances of becoming friends with somebody. You can read the psychological literature, change your habits, change your patterns of conversation, but that doesn't mean you can go out and make somebody your friend. Right. Right. right? You're going to be my friend now. You're going to fall in love with me. Right. That, right. So dialectic has that same relationship to dialogos. It's a set of practices. But if you think you're making dialogos, yes. you're not yes. getting dialogos. Yes. It's like, yeah. right. Right. And so it, it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's more like a platonic uh, education than sort of a, a Lockean education. Right. It's, I can give you a pedagogical progression of practices, but like Plato says in the seventh letter, it's got to catch fire for its own at some point. Yeah. Yes. And that can't, and that causality can't be reduced to any methodology within the pedagogy. It doesn't yeah. mean the pedagogy is useless. It's a necessary, but not sufficient condition. Yeah. Well, that, that final point is a point which is, which is repeated so many times in, in every mystical literature that I've come across where it's not our techniques and practices which earn us or which create or which make us have the experience, it's those that simply prepare us, that empty the space for the experience to come. In, 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 in Christian terminology, we'd call it the grace, the gift that's given once yeah. we make the space for it. Once we have the silence, then we, we, can, we, can, we can begin to hear the, you know, the music of the cosmos or the word of God or whatever it is. Yes, there's a, Zen, there's a Zen statement that I really like about that. It says, enlightenment cannot be found by seeking but it is not fine. It is never found by those who do not seek. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's there's an interesting um, parallel Jewish expression, which is um, yagata umatsata ta. I mean, that if someone seeks and they and they find, then then you should believe them. And it's read to mean that that you can you can you can work to earn, but but what you find is not commiserate to what you've earned, to what you've worked. It's something which right, specifically right. you've stumbled upon, which is which is beyond the effort that you put into it. But you're but you have right. to be looking for it, else you don't find it. Yes, um, exactly. In, in, and and also in consonance to your first point of 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 absorbing the sage or or internalizing the sage, I think is the word you use. I'll I'll have right. you know that from the Jewish tradition, this goes all the way back to 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 the way that the rabbis read the Bible, where where the verse in Deuteronomy, I think it is, commands the individual to cleave to God, the daf mm. to to cleave to God. Um, and and in a, and in a way which is repeated in many other traditions, the sages say, "How can we clean? How can we cleave to that which is transcendent and ineffable and beyond and infinite?" And and the answer is, "Ladavka betamidei chachamim to cleave to the sages." And through oh, cleaving wow. to the sages who emulate the divine, we we are we in ourselves cleave to the divine and and then begin to emulate the, the divine ourselves. Well, um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank I. You. T to be very honest, I, I, I was thought of offering my services here um, of, of love, which is that like all the points that you're mentioning, you mentioned that you don't have like an expertise in Sufism and, and, and Jewish mysticism, which is great because usually when people don't have expertise, they just keep talking. But but that's firstly, like kudos for, for, for doing that. But if there's ever anything which, you're, which, you're, which you know is being said around mystical traditions or religious traditions, and you're looking for the Jewish parallel, 
just shoot me a text and I'll tell you exactly where it is with like a with the source. Okay, I'll take you up on that. I'm going to take you up on that. Um, so, so that's so the the other astounding thing, which is which is coming up from what you're saying, is is firstly just the the richness and and the depth of these practices. You you've really not just thought theoretically and sort of you know you know there's a lot of, a lot of theorizing can 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 be cannot be it's a lot of sort of pie in the sky kind of thinking yeah, yeah. but to actually go and and, and and think about actual implement like implementation and actual and yeah. seeing what's supported that's that's really really incredible um and i've only begun to to see what's happening in in the community that seems like is developing around your work with with the work of circling the work of mindfulness meditation and, and this yeah. this uh, distributive thinking and consciousness so yeah. so that's 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 a really fascinating thing as well um, and I, I'd be curious, perhaps, to to know how much conscious work is being done to integrate techniques that have been developed for thousands of years by um, mystical traditions around the world into to to be then studied by by contemporary cognitive science models and forms. So that's thank you. That that that's a beautiful segue question in which I can do some um, some shameless self promotion of my of my next big project. Um, so. My next project is called After Socrates, right? Which is the cultivation of wisdom and virtue uh, through dialectical and dialogical practices, all right? Uh, that's not gonna be the, the final title. It's gonna be After Socrates and then what after comes after the colon, I'm not, I haven't settled on yet. But the, here's the primary idea. The primary idea is, it, and I'm doing a lot of experimental uh, 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 participant observation and a lot, of particip- a, lot, a lot of participant experimentation in a lot of these emerging communities of authentic relation, uh, discourse, insight dialogue, um, emergent dialogue, like, and they're springing up all over the place and they're, and, and they're, and they're not springing up. But when I say springing up, I mean I don't mean that they're ephemeral. Many of them have been existence for in existence for decades, and they're and they're building up sustained vital communities, and they're networking communities together into subcultures. That's happening, and I'm involved in it. And I get to talk to the people, wow. like you know, like Thomas Toninger and Elizabeth the Bold in Germany, or Guy Senstock, right? Or, or or and there's even there's even sort of corresponding homes for it, like Rebel Wisdom on on, on YouTube, right, Um, etc. So that's happening now. And I think of that, and and, you know, my, my partner in a lot of this work, Christopher Massey Petra, we we think of this as one of the most primary positive responses to the meaning crisis that's happening right now. Hmm. Um, And the way it's trying to get below, uh, you know, zero sum game political adversarial discourse uh, uh, to something else. Yes. Um, I think that's important. So there's that, but there's there's a part of me that also says, but there's this rich tradition coming out of Socrates and spreading to you know Kierkegaard and the Stoics and John Scotus Erigenes and and Montaigne and like 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 there's all of this and and it's and it's spreading even into the revival of Stoicism today and it's in, it's in the guts of CBT and it's coming out in uh, you know uh, IFS internal family systems therapy like it's everywhere over here this this whole legacy and it's like okay i'm going to try and so i want to understand that historically and cognitive scientifically and then i want to understand this existentially and transformatively and in participation and then i want to try and put them together mm. To get them to mutually re- reciprocally reconstruct each other. That's the project yes. of, yeah. of the new series after Socrates. To precisely yes. to get those those two things you were pointing to, to get them. I can't do all of the past, I could, but I can do the past yes. for which yes. I have the relevant yes. expertise and try. Can I take that and can I put it into a deep relationship with and vice versa with the all these emerging dialectical uh, communities? That's yeah. that's the core of the next project. Yeah. So that's that's really fascinating and really and tremendously exciting. I'm um, I'm curious on on both ends. It seems like there's a specific choice which you're making, which 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 may seem um, counterintuitive or, or or non-intuitive. Which is that from f- most of the talk that I hear from from the communities that are emerging now around dialogue, dialogues, which I know is very important to you, and and the tradition which you're pulling from is very much from the the post-Socratic philosophical tradition and, and the names you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. I, I, I wonder perhaps just maybe to, to, to throw this out there. There's, there's, um, I mean, the, the traditions, which th- there is a reading of, of the philosophers by done by Pierre Hadot and others that you mentioned that, yeah. that are reading them this way, certainly, but, um, but, but it seems to be 
at, at the very least a secondary reading, which 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 may not make it incorrect or but but it's it's secondary as far as public consciousness goes. In 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 the minds uh, in the in the public mind's eye, the people who were developing the <laughs> the routes to these transformative experiences were not necessarily the philosophers. Um, but were the mystics, and and th- they mean there's, there's not exclusive categories. I'm very interested in yeah. philosophical mystics, yeah. um, and 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 vice versa. Why why why? And, and and I think because of that choice, it's therefore reflected more in in the dialogical. Why yeah. why why not focus more directly on the mystics themselves, um, and 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 take from them what they the the the, the technologies which they developed, um, which 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 I think may look something. If if I had to sort of make a very far guess to sort of extrapolate here, may look something less dialogical. Um, and I'm, I keep hearing Boober when I when I when I hear this. But, yeah, but Boober's going to be in the series. Boober's going to be in the well, series. I'm glad. I'm such a fan. I'm such a fan of him. Honestly, Boober um, Boober properly belongs in the series. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely. But 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 I think I think Boober. So Boober himself is a great case study for this point, which I'm asking now because Boober, in his earlier work, he he did his PhD on Nicholas Fukuza, and in his early work, yeah, uh, in yeah. Daniel and others, he what he was much more unitive and much more um, monistic, whatever how, however you want to call it. He he then transitioned to, to to dialogue, and I and I think that I think that that's perhaps what differentiates him belonging to the Socratic tradition as as for belonging to the Mystics tradition proper, um and and and. I think I think what may emerge from the mystics, if, if from the philosophers and the Socratic tradition emerges dialogue, what may emerge from the mystics is something more, which is, I think, directly re- relational in terms of deeply identifying with with all the parts of ourselves in a, in a way that can integrate them and unify them with with others around us, with the world around us, with with the absolute or the divine, if if that's if that's desired, and 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 I think as well, maybe just to to, to close on this, I think. I, I don't know the science. Anyway, I don't come to your toe on the science, but but I think what what gives actually gives meaning to people in their lives is not just having great uh, coffee philosophy conversations in the no, bookstore, no, 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 but no, it's no. actual deep lived relationships with with love and identity and belonging and family and friends and yeah, that's um, totally that's totally appropriate. Um, uh, so uh, let, let me answer like there was sort of freedom. I, I mean, I I picked this tradition first of all because. It's the uh, it's the, the 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 emerging discourses around distributed cognition and collective intelligence, um, and that tradition plugs into it. So you know, and um, and the connections are like both Thomas Stoddinger and Guy Sendstock are deeply influenced by Heidegger, and so calling to the the Socratic Platonic tradition, and they're you know they're the originators of these communities. That 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 so there's there there's there, and I this isn't trivial, but there are practical reasons yes. for the choice. Yes. Secondly, and this is the more important part of your question, um, and, and I, you know, I, I, we have the book out there, inner and outer dialogues. I mean, one of the problem with uh, with Boob, I mean, there's a good book on the uh, on the Boober Young uh, debate, um, and and the book basically says they're they're both sort of getting it wrong, um, which I think is is kind of right. Mm-hmm. But the point I want to make about that is uh, that's it, that lines up with. It, I think if you look deeply, and, and I think this comes to fruition in, in somebody like Eregina, but I think you can e- e- also see it deeply if you read it properly and uh, if you read what's happened. We have to remember that when you're reading Proclus, you're not reading a treatise. You're reading a discussion he's having with his students, Yes. right? Yeah. Uh, and so the idea is this. Uh, uh, there's a lot here. Uh, oh, man, we, we, we could have a whole thing about I, I, I When I'm talking about dialectic and dialogos, I'm not just talking about something like this between you and I. Mm-hmm. I'm also talking about something like this between mm. me and being, mm. and those two are interwoven together. And what's what's impressive when you do the experimental when you do the experimental uh, you know participation and the participant observation is how that occurs. So, mm. for example, let's take something like circling, and this is why Guy Sendstock now has moved from talking about circling to talking about dialogos, mm. right? It's because when you when you get circling, what happens is people and you know we had a moment that, not that long ago. In fact, it's kind of more and more here. Where you get this important intimacy with others, and I don't mean sexual intimacy. I mean the kind of, I mean the communing that yeah. underwrites and makes communication possible. And people, when they rediscover that, that's inherently valuable to them, just yeah. in and of itself. I'm sorry for yes. that. Okay. And, and so that's powerful and important. But what happens is, right, when people, are, and this doesn't always happen. Again, no, no, no algorithm here. But yeah. what can frequently appear maybe that's the right way or manifest mm. is what happens is 
People go from being intimate with others to being intimate to the logos, to the shit, to this dynamical system that's shared between them that transcends each individual. They call yeah. it the we space. Yes. And sometimes that, that, and you can, you can see how this is so neoplatonic. Right. And you, you move to, you, you know, you're moving from sort of suke to, to something more like noesis. But then what can happen is, right. And this is even more rare, but, but it doesn't mean it doesn't occur <coughs> with some degree of reliability is people can go from, okay, there's intimacy with, with you and with you and with you. And then there's the intimacy with the we that transcends us. And then there's intimacy through the we to reality. Yes. And they get, and so there is properly, and, and what's interesting is people who come from very different backgrounds naturally fall into religious and spiritual language to talk about that. Mm. Mm. So there is properly a vertical dimension, if you'll allow me to use these spatial metaphors, and a horizontal dimension. And then there is, there's a, like, there's a, there's the third dimension between them where they are resonating with each other. So there becomes, they're not identical, but this resonance and this resonance are also harmonically resonating with each other. And so the distinction between, right? The, the, so the distinction between mystical ascent and dialogical interpenetration um, tends to disappear. And so when you look at the Neoplatonic tradition, when they're talking about dialectic, they are talking both of a practice you do with other people and then a practice you do on your own inter, inter ontologically, and that the two are inseparably necessary for each other. Mm. Because this helps me get outside and deeply challenge the egocentrism that the vertical might do. And the vertical helps me to get outside of any of the anthropomorphism mm. that the horizontal might trap me within. That's very good. That's very good. What what each one does for the other, um, yes. I'm I'm just I'm just noticing um, like a, a meta uh, like um, realization here is that both this conversation and the one we which we began with, where I was like sort of pushing more for the for the mysticism in the unitive, and you sort of just explain why what's already happening is reaching for that. So that's that's a that's a cool thing. I'm wondering there's there's a theme which I'm obsessed with in mysticism, and and uh, and it, it it appears most strongly I think in the mythological representations of mysticism. Um, I think the best scholar who's covered this is Mircea Liade, the, the Romanian scholar, um, who identifies a process of um, of initiation uh, through covering over a liminal space, and 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 there is a, a death and rebirth that occurs. In any yeah. of your research or reckoning and the or your practice, is do do you, is there is there something equivalent to, to that death rebirth experience? There is. I, I don't I don't know if it, I would say equivalent, but definitely strongly convergent. So I have been deeply. I was going to say transformed, but there's a there's a pun in there. I've been deeply <laughs> affected um, by the work of L.A. Paul um, on. She literally wrote the book Transformative Experience, and I, I've gotten to know Laurie uh, more directly, like personally. Nice. Um, just astonishingly brilliant philosopher, um, and, and then I don't know her, uh, Agnes Keller, but uh, her book on aspiration. These two uh, books, and then ultimately Iris Murdoch, um, especially the Sovereignty of Good. Those three women are like in my mind, right? Uh, um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that they're all women, by the way. I think there's something important going on there. Um, but that's another conversation as well. The, 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 the point that, uh, that L.A. Paul makes um, about transformative experience is one that I, uh, that I take very profound. Because I, I take wisdom to be an aspirational project in which the individual is trying to fundamentally transform themselves. This is unlike learning about Mesopotamia. That, like you are fundamentally changing yourself. Um, you're going through a, the most profound kind of transformative experience. And mystical experiences are prototypically described in the literature, in the scientific literature, as the most transformative experiences yes. of people's lives. Um, that's one of the ways in which they they reliably distinguish themselves from merely psychedelic experiences, for example. Yes. yes. Okay. So let's take that the, there's at least significant overlap there. And and, and then the, and then uh, L.A. Paul, I keep wanting to say Laurie. L.A. Paul, right, um, brings up the, the, the problem. And just give me a moment because it will it'll jive with what you said right and so just give me a moment please you have my attention he says, 
Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, uh, so she says, you know, your friends come up to you and they offer with just incontrovertible evidence that they, they can turn you into a vampire. Now, do you do it? And then she says, well, the problem with that is you, the standard way we're supposed to make decisions is we're supposed to take our knowledge of the probabilities and our, our, the values we assign to them, multiply them together, and the one with the highest product is our decision. And then she says, but notice, and, and she was happy with me using this language. I've used it in her present. She points to a kind of symmetrical, perspectival and participatory ignorance we have. We don't know what it's going to be like to be a vampire. We don't know what that perspectival knowing will be like. Mm -hmm. And we also don't know what our identity will be like when we become a vampire, because we will have different preferences. We will consider different things virtues, right? Right. So we don't know, but we have, we're both, we don't know the probabilities and we don't know the values we're going to assign to the probabilities. We're deeply ignorant. So, oh, well, then don't do it. But then you also don't know what you're, you, you don't know what you're going to miss, but you also don't know what you're going to lose, right? right? So you don't know what you're going to lose when you go through the transformation, but you also don't know what you're going to miss if you don't do the transformation. So you can't say, well, do nothing because you're ignorant, because the ignorance cuts both ways, yes. right? You might be giving up the best thing possible for yes. you, absolutely the best, yes. right? And, the, and, the, and, 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 she, and she sort of stops there. Um, she offers some things later on but I won't get into the detail because my, my take on that was, okay, but then if we can't sort of infer our way to it, what do human beings do? Because here's L.A. Paul's point. We forget this fantasy about vampires. We make these kinds of decisions all the time, right? Have a child. Being a child is no good education on how to be a parent. Right, right. Or even, right. What, it's like to be, or even what it's like to be a parent. Yes, or even what it's like to be a parent. And you don't know what it's going to be like until you do it. And your values are going to change because if you're any good, good kind of parent, you're going to go through this fundamental reorientation of what, like the child is more important to you, right? And you just go, right? Or, you know, or decide to get into a long-term romantic relationship with another individual. If you really love them, they are going to change you in a fundamental way or else you're not really in love with them. Yes. And the examples are countless, right? So I thought to myself, well, what do human beings do? Right now, a lot of times they just sort of fall into things. Right. So I, I don't want to deny that. But is that is that is that the best? Well, then I thought, well, no, there's a context in which people wrestle with these kinds of decisions. And it's very pervasive when we have literature about it and, and research about it, which is the therapeutic context, because that's where people go in. Right. And, 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 and they right and, and they don't know what it's going to be like or how they're right. And that's they have the propositional knowledge. I don't want to be stubborn anymore. Right. Right. Or I don't want to be so anxious anymore. But they don't know what it's they don't know. Part of why it's hard is because they're facing a transformative experience. Right. Yes. yes. So what's going on in therapy or what do people do when they are considering having a child or, or, or what do people do when they're considering a romantic relationship? So I was looking at. What's a convergent thing? And what I, what I hit upon is what's actually at the crux of development is people engage in serious play. Hmm, yes. What they do, right, for a child is they'll often get a pet and they'll hmm. practice on the pet and hmm. see. So the pet allows them to get a taste, a perspectival and participatory taste without hmm. having fully committed irrevocably yes. to the yes. transformation, um, right? And, and obviously in therapy, what they do is they engage in serious play with the therapist before they actually go into the full-blown real world transformation. Yes. And what about the romantic relationships? People will give you this and it's, it's pretty good advice actually. They'll say, uh, this is pre-COVID advice actually, of course. They'll say, <laughs> well, go, travel with the person for a couple yes, of weeks. Yes, yes, yes. Or, 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 or this is yeah. another one. Speak, spend a weekend painting the, a house with them. Yes. And the idea is what you're doing in, and you think about Winnicott and others, right? What we do in play is we do this thing where we have what Apter calls a cognitive synergy. So, and this goes back to Corbin's distinction between the imaginary and the imaginal, right? So the imaginary is you make pictures in your mind, but the, the imaginal is like when a child, you know, ties a blanket around their neck and pretends to be Superman, right? Mm -hmm. They're interacting with the world mm -hmm. in a particular way. Now think about the child playing. They both are and are not They're right? They're taking on some of the aspects but they're not taking on the full aspects. And what they're doing is they're tasting versions of adulthood, right? So that they can make their way towards it. Yeah. And so I think that um, we have to go through these 
a kind of death and rebirth experience when we're going through transformative experience. And what takes us through that liminal period is serious play. The reason why I put an emphasis on serious is because it's aspirational. It's not frivolous. It's not for fun. It's for transformation. It's serious play. And this is why I think we keep alive practices of serious play like music and art and other things. And I would propose to you that you can see a significant part of religion as the use of an imaginal augmentation, like uh, augmented reality. You know what augmented reality yeah, is? Sure. Oh, yes. it has, so it's imaginally augmented reality that allows us to engage in a serious play that affords real aspirational transformation for individuals. And so I think that is um, where we go through. And of course, the seriousness can be very deep. Yes. I mean, people often use death and rebirth language when they've gone through significant therapeutic transformation. Yes. yes um, yeah. and, and people talk similarly, obviously, in, re in religious contexts. And people will sometimes talk about this when they make some of these other transformative experiences. Um, you'll hear it when people talk about going from one career where that's been vocational to them to another career that's been vocational to them. Yes. Um, so that's, that, that's, I think, I, and I think of, I think of these ecologies of practices and philosophy, at least in the sense of philosophy as serious play. Yeah. That's really cool. I, that's really, really cool. I want to, I want to respond to that uh, in terms of the, the actual play of, of, of death and rebirth that happens mythologically in indigenous communities. But I, I forgot to check with you actually, um, what's your time constraints like? Oh, well, I should probably go soon. We, we've been at it for like a couple of hours and, and I'm heading towards, uh, I, I, I don't want to stop, uh, but I, I should end soon I, I, okay. because I, I'm just sort of, uh, there's things that I need to address sure. that, uh, but um but, but I mean, I, I meant what I said. I'd like to follow this up with having you on uh, Voices with Verveke, and then we could part one, part two, our conversation yeah, uh, and, yeah. and introduce our audience to each other in, in a friendly fashion. That would be, that would, I really appreciate that. That would be really great. Um, and I, 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 won't, I won't try to keep you for, for too much longer. And I hope it's more than just the two. I, hope, I, hope, I really hope to, to continue this relationship. I'm very open to this. I've, I think this is very vital and important. I, I mean... I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a novice. I, I think I'm a serious student of mysticism, but um, I think, I think you're, you have an expertise in it that I find valuable and important. I appreciate it. Um, so. So let me, so let me respond then to your point on, on, on real play. It's very interesting that you say that because that you, that you've attached play to, to, to death and rebirth, which I wouldn't have thought to have done. Uh, because specifically when, when Eliade speaks about in his real seminal essays on this, the way that death and rebirth is done is through the enactment of play where the child yeah. will will go into the will go into the into the into the wilderness um and will in different variations of it and Eliade really goes through all of the different traditions where they'll either be put inside the belly the effigy the effigy the belly yeah. of the beast where they'll be playing yeah. as if they've been swallowed by this you know this very archetypal image yeah. or and then they'll come back to the village and the and the the, the, the parents the fathers will be wearing the masks of the of the jinn of the demon whatever it is and they'll have to yeah. rip the mask off this is that this is like this is play at its at its most serious and i think one yeah. of the tragedies and and i i wonder i wonder if you agree with this one of the tragedies and perhaps one of the very large um causes and f of of the current um meaning crisis which is really your expertise is the fact that we do not have trans serious play of transitional rituals for people leaving childhood to adulthood like in in the oh, jewish in, yeah. the, in the Jewish community, we have a bar and bas mitzvah, but you're doing nothing. What are you, what are you doing? You're getting some presents. You're having an evening with your friends. Yeah. You're not facing death. You're not facing the death of your childhood to be reborn as an adult. I'd be curious to, to know if you agree on that. I totally agree on that. I, I, I've i got Han's book, you know, The Death of Ritual, and I'm, I'm about to read it. Uh, but I, I, think, I think the proper description of ritual is serious play. Mm. Uh, serious play that is, seek, that is seeking developmental transformation like we've talked about here. And I think that the death of ritual and the fact that we now equate ritual with either like, like routine, yes. like brushing your teeth is a ritual. No, it's not. I don't think of it. I don't think of it as a ritual. Could you turn it into a ritual? Maybe, but is it a ritual? No, I don't practice. It's not a ritual. Um, so, or, or else a neurotic compulsion 
Yes. That's not ritual, right? Like the, so those two equations I think should be dispensed with. I think they're misleading and, and fundamentally misrepresentational of the phenomenon. They mislead people <clears throat> in a profound way. And I think I think our lack <clears throat> of that kind of ritual in our, our in our culture is important. And I think it goes to Zach Stein's point about I, I think it's it, it can it, it, it it's reinforced by another sort of noxious trend where we have ch- I think the main, I agree with Zach Stein. I think the main function of education is, right, is intergenerational, right, transfer. Yes. The fact that, again, the cultural ratcheting, that we don't start, we don't, we're, unlike other organism, we don't have to start from scratch. We can rely on everything that has been built before. Think yes. about what a gift yes. that is. Yes. Think about what a fundamental gift that is, right? And so education is about keeping that intergenerational cultural mm-hmm. ratcheting going. Yes. We have reduced, we have reduced education to preparing us for the market. Yes. It's not yes. that it shouldn't do that, but that should be secondary because the market is temporary compared to culture. Yes. Yes. Right? And so that, that denigration is also, again, like you said, we've lost the sense of the important rituals that bind us to these cultural transmissions. Yes. Wow. I mean, as someone who who spent so much time, both myself as a as a subject or as a student pupil in the Jewish religious educational system, and then going back as a teacher, the seeing seeing how how important the the ability to connect someone deeply to their own heritage and culture and tradition. And, and and even to embrace it as serious play, but but to but to embrace it as serious play, um, is so 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 important for meaning, um, and the criticism of, of education is one which I share. Um, I think I think I'm gonna do the courteous thing and and let you go. I'll I'll maybe just <laughs> throw in a, a monkey wrench here and excuse the the pun here because of your compar- your comparison of autodidactism with the monkey who gets stuck in the tar. Um, yeah. No no one is abs- no one is completely an autodidact. Um, but I was a bit uh, aghast to hear your thoughts on autodidactism because I consider myself an autodidact. I, I have no <laughs> academic degree and and uh, I have no, I have nothing that's... So, so I'd be curious perhaps at another time to hear, unless I just shot myself in the foot and that's like, I don't want to hear from this, from this Evie guy again. He's uh but, um, but I'd be curious. No, no, to- not at all. You did not, no, no, not at all. I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, and, and please remember that's a psychological criticism which do, which always always has with it the caveat of individual differences. It doesn't yeah. mean that it's not possible for an autodidact to succeed, but we're talking about what are the propensities and probabilities. Um, and so, um, and I hope this isn't too offensive. I mean, I can also put on the table of autodidact people like Hitler and others who are yeah. classical autodidacts, <laughs> and 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 they, and they exemplify some of the significant dangers within being an autodidact, which is you reinforce. Yes. egocentrism you reinforce yes. confirmation bias yes. Yes. right yes. all of that stuff um uh, and so that's my concern my concern i, I mean I, I i'm a little bit strident because there's an implicit critique of the self-help movement in that that i'm mm-hmm. trying to mm-hmm. get very close to being explicit uh because <clears throat> i think the self-help movement is largely not helping people for even though the title is there and i think it misleads people and, and I think it reinforces a, a kind of individualism, which is not the same thing as individual responsibility. Yes. It reinforces an individualism that I think is ultimately, again, misleading in a powerful and uh, often deleterious way. Yeah. So that's yeah. the nature of the criticism. But I'd yeah. be happy to unpack and explore that with yeah, you at yeah. length. I, I, I agree. I agree with that criticism. It's all very reasonable. Um, I think I think maybe there's a bit of space to be open for people who, in extenuating circumstances, were not afforded the capacity to go and yeah. uh, and study yeah. in ways which they would have. I I mean I in a growing up in a Hasidic household was explicitly f- forbidden from going to university. Um, right. So, but that's that's a maybe an interesting. Yeah, I want to just just to put it out there when we do get to talk again, um, if I have you back here or after we speak, whatever it is, I I I, do, I would love to pick on what I thought was really brilliant in your lectures was your not just your description of the phenomenology of the mystical experience, but your prescriptive description of mystical experience and why it should be taken seriously by someone who thinks yeah. seriously. And I think that your argumentation was highly original. Um, and I've been reading, I've, I've, I'm trying, I'm on a quest to read everything good that's been written about mysticism. And I've yet to come right. across someone formulating that argument the way you have. So I'd love to unpack that with you another time. Let's do that. So um, I tell you what, uh, uh, yeah. send me an email about some available times for you. 
in, in, in the next month or so, next three or four weeks. And we'll set up a time for you to come on Voices with Perveki. And I'll, I'll advertise on my platform uh, about part one. See, I, I'm really working on trying, I, I don't know if you've seen any of the elusive eye, but I'm really working on trying to integrate progressive argumentation with a, a, you know expressive dialogue, mm. uh, dialogos. Mm. And so I, this is another way of potentially, like if, if we do a, a, you know, a running progressive discussion, but back yep. and forth. Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, you know, let, let's plan for doing this for, for, for a bit. Uh, awesome. uh, you know. that, sounds, that sounds really wonderful. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm so open to that. You know, Plotinus calls, uh, calls the mystical journey the flight of the alone to the alone, right? And, yeah. and for me, it's been a very lonely experience because I did not do it in university. I didn't have mentors and have tutors. Um, so having someone who I can look up to intellectually and I can really ask serious questions from, for me, is very, is really very, very, valid, very, very valuable. And it makes the flight of the alone to the alone all that less lonely. So, so really, thank you. Thank you. I mean, um, uh, <laughs> you, you, uh, you bring a caliber to this that is exemplary. Um, so for whatever lack of formal education you might have, it, uh, it's not making any significant difference to the depth I, I find that I'm getting with, into with you and, and, and the perspicaciousness of it uh, um, and, and the, you know, and, and the accessible profundity. Uh, um, you should be congratulated. Um, so. I appreciate uh, yeah. that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also, yeah, I'm also very, you, you have a very strong um, vision of what conversation can aspire to be. Um, yeah. and, and I'm very, um, I, I'd be curious to be, I, I would like to be a student of that to, to, to best participate in, in that vision that you have. So uh, looking forward to that. Well, me too. Me too. Much love. Thank you very much. It was great. I really, uh, well, I look forward to continuing this. Yes. An absolute pleasure. I'll, I'll, we'll be in touch over email.